What's up, everybody? Welcome to the channel today. Um, we're doing kind of an emergency live stream because we've got some incredible stuff that we need to cover today that many of you probably haven't heard about yet or haven't done enough research yet on. So I'm excited for you guys to, to be here today to listen to this message. Um, if you haven't done so already, hit that thumbs up so we wake up the algorithm and more people find the channel today um, and find this live stream. And then also, I'm going to ask each of you to do one thing, and that is to invite one more person to the live stream today and um, let them know what we're doing. OK, and then even after this, I think you want to share you're going to want to share this message as well. Um, so I've got a guest here. Um, I've got Ted here as a guest. He has recently been putting together a YouTube channel. Um, I saw him on Ron's Basement the other day. Ron's Basement, a shout out to Ron, um, is one of my favorite channels that I like to watch and get some of my um, news as well as. Um, I just have a lot of fun with how down to earth Ron is. The fact that he's in his basement, that he's got bears with blindfolds on him is awesome. And he's got numbers on there. And I'm looking forward to him ripping off all those blindfolds um, and coming up with the next the next thing that he's going to do, which will be fun. I'm um, sort of raising the basement up to the ra to the attic. <laughs> Ron's basement. We're going to move it up to Ron's attic. And Susie's going to get all upset because the main floor is going to be shaking and everything. And, oh my gosh, what happened here? Ted has left the vault door open. That's what's going to happen here. Today. It. We're going to have fun. Well, it's funny. I actually, Ron sent me a message yesterday on one of my comments and said, let's, let's get together and do some collaboration on it. And um, it was funny because um, at first, he said, this surfer guy needs to come off of the uh, internet. He's horrible. And then he said, just kidding. And I had to read it. But it, it didn't come through that way. I was like, oh, no. One of like my protege, my, my mentors here is like freaking out on me. But um, what he said is, help me get out of the basement. We need to go surfing. I mean, he didn't exactly say it in those words. But I think we're going to need to get him out here and go surfing one of these days. So. Well, I think I'd like to watch the sunrise from his roof. That's what I'm going to do. There you go. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> come on, folks. Let's get involved in this thing. Invite people in because... If you've never had a certified financial planner sit down and do a financial plan for you, it's quite involved. And on the low side, the cost is about fifteen hundred dollars. On the five, on the high side, it's about six thousand. We were charging around fifty five hundred, but that was for a fee only plan. So it means that we don't sell anything that would have commissions or any of it. But that was uh, I sold the practice in two thousand ten. I started it, goodness, probably back in nineteen eighty seven or eighty eight. And um, very interesting story. Um, I had uh, sold my company. I'd sold it, started a printer ribbon manufacturing company called National Computer Ribbons Corporation, manufacturing okay. computer printer ribbons for computer printers and word processors, Okadata, Diablo, Epson, all those kind of things. But see, what happens is the ink is mixed with mineral spirits over in Japan, where they ink the nylon ribbons. Well, the mineral spirits evaporate, and by the time you ship them across the Pacific Ocean in big containers, and the, the, the changing temperatures and humidities and all that stuff, even though they're shrink-wrapped, each individual uh, ribbon is shrink-wrapped, by the time it gets to the West Coast and it's distributed through brown UPS trucks, right? They get real hot inside. By the time they reach the owner, by the end user, my gosh, the, the ribbon is dried out. Well, the reason it's dried out is because the mineral spirits have evaporated. So mm -hmm. what I decided to do was, geez, these uh, printer ribbons are just starting to take off and PCs. Remember the uh, Commodore 64? I you do, know? actually. I do. Wow. Yep. Goodness. You certainly don't look like you're old enough to remember the Commodore 64. <laughs> Does anybody out there remember the Commodore 64? Right. Besides I'll, me? Give you a quick, I'll give you a quick history thing. My father-in-law was best friends with Nolan Bushnell, who started Atari. Oh. So they went to high school together. Nolan came over to his house for Thanksgiving and Christmas mm -hmm. dinner. And my father-in-law turned down the first investment into Atari for 500 bucks. He didn't have it at yeah. the time. He was a freshman in college. So um, I go all the way back as far as, you know, I, I go back at least as far as to where the kind of the PCs were starting. So, so uh, what I wanted to finish up with was, um, so I sold National Computer Ribbons Corporation and went back to the law firm that put together the, or handled the sale of it, Gebhardt and Smith in Baltimore. And they said, hey, Ted, we'll do your estate plan for you for free. I was single at the time. Okay. So I took a look at the state plan. I was reading through it. And said, I took it to a friend of mine who was an estate planning attorney. He said, Wilson, what's up with this? And he said, what do you mean, Ted? I said, they drafted themselves in in all aspects of the estate plan. Yep. And he said, well, that's what they do. And I said, Did, they never even asked me. And he said, well, that's the way it is, Ted. And I said, W. I said, that can't last. You mean to tell me people are going in and having legal documents drawn up and they really don't know what they say? Well, most people don't read the fine print. And I said, that's the end of that. I said, we're going to start a fully integrated estate planning firm where the legal, the investment, the finance and the tax are all put together. And we used an acronym called LIFT, 
everybody needs a lift, legal, insurance, financial, and tax. So the idea is, is that all these different disciplines are typically are typically pulled together independent of one another. Okay. So let's suppose you and I are going to build a new car and we're going to take an engine from Ford, a transmission from GM and uh, possibly a chassis from Volvo. And we're going to make the wheels real nice. We'll get something from Mercedes Benz or something like that. Assuming that you and I are competent, which we are. Okay. We could get the road, the car to go down the road, right? Yep. If we hobbled it, hobbled it together, we get the car down the road. The question, though, is how efficient would it be if we don't have everything matched together? Oh, would we're going to have efficient? all problems. That's right. Now, yeah. we're on the way out to California. I'm going to see you from Baltimore, okay? okay. I'm on the way out to California. Do you think I'm going to be getting the same kind of fuel mileage as a vehicle would be getting if everything was designed to work together? No, especially, no. If, uh, especially if you have parts that aren't talking to each other. Oh, that's the big part. You know why? Because the attorneys don't really like the insurance guys and the insurance guys don't like the attorneys and the CPAs. They're sort of, you know, milk toast. Okay. And then you got the other, um, the other investments and the other finances that are involved in it, like the financial planner. They don't talk to one another. And that's the problem. So what I did started a firm called the Provenza Group. And we had lawyers and CPAs, accountants, everybody worked together. So when the clients came in, they told their story one time. Now, we always had a box of Kleenex there and get water on the table because we were dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. I mean, people talking about, well, my son got wrapped up in heroin and this and that. And, and this, their couple's not doing well. But we, I learned all the ins and outs. So when I sold the practice in 2010, oh, my gosh, probably had about 1,800 different individuals and companies. The big one was American Express. They wanted to buy it. But what they want to do is tear everything apart. I said, no, man, I got plans together with these people. You know, I rip everything apart. So uh, I got rid of the ones that wanted to pull everything apart. And I took a closer look at those that really wanted to do something with the practice. And the number one guy I found, he just didn't have it cognitively, I guess, to pull together the legal, the finance, the taxes and all that stuff. So he's just managing the money. So um, sold it with about 700 million of assets under management, built it from zero and did it mainly from um, talking to people on the radio, just one to one. I so, love it. Uh, I was so told I had a radio voice more than a face for for uh, for podcasting or live streaming or whatever you're gonna call it. You got it. You got it. You got a great face. You have a great personality. You've got a lot of great high energy. Um, mm. I when I saw you on Ron's basement, I was like, oh my gosh, I hope I can have this this guy on my on my channel one of these days. And um, your channel is gonna blow up. Don't worry about it. You've got a, a great message there. So well, quick question: You, you said something yeah. to me at ten o'clock last night, and I just finished a very long day. I had a I had a meeting, folks with a former Illuminati hot high-end guy. I oh, saw no. the credit card, I, no, I'm not kidding. I saw the credit card, the black uh, American Express open credit card. Yep. It says Gilderberg, G-U-I-L-D-E-R-B-E-R-G. I have information, I have recordings that he was allowed me, he allowed me to make. I don't want to get into that here. What we have to do. Um, we have to do those on Tuesday. That's the tinfoil Tuesdays. We've got to do that one on with you, Ted, one of these days. Uh, how many times has the tinfoil guys been wrong? <laughs> not well nowadays not really very that's often. right okay you just see in the future before it happens yeah exactly so jared where would you like to go okay so qu real quick um one disclaimer i'm just going to throw out i personally am not a financial advisor so anything we're sharing on the channel today guys you got to do your homework do your research on it but we're going to share some incredible ideas and concepts with you today can we so, talk just a little bit about financial planner versus financial advisor? Is that okay? Yes. Right so let, I would love to have you clarify that. So here's here's another thing. I'm in the I fired all of my financial advisors. Okay. I haven't Good. really had a financial planner as of the last ten years. We're I'm hard in the to find. Of needing one right now. Mm -hmm. They were hard to find because they've They're made hard, the, yeah. uh, the penalty so onerous. When I was a financial planner, when and running the Provenza Group, um, the penalties for a client not understanding properly what it is that I said is immediate $10,000. Okay, so real, real quick, just to stop years. for a second. Good. Can you put a, put a one in the chat if you guys can hear Ted? Uh, if you cannot put a two in the chat. I just want to make sure we can hear him. I can hear him fine on my end. How are we doing there, folks? We got a lot to cover. You better be tuned in. <laughs> I want to make sure you guys can hear him right now, so... All right. How are we doing? Right, we're going to have a lot of ones. They can hear you. Okay. We're going to okay, continue. Great. All right. Super. If you can't hear him, go ahead and hit that volume up. If um, if your computer speaker's not loud enough and you've got a TV, go get in on YouTube right now on your okay. TV and hit that. So we're talking about the difference between a financial advisor and a financial planner. First of yes. all, anybody can fog a mirror can be a financial advisor. 
no yes, test. Yes, I no, found no, that to be true. Like okay. And there's no liability. You can tell the client whatever you want. You know, you might get caught once in a while, but, you know, it's certainly not like a financial planner. When you're a financial planner, you're a fiduciary for the client. You have to put the client's uh, uh, needs and wishes and their objectives ahead of your own. So if you could sell a product making 10% commission, or how about 7% commission? That's going to come back to haunt us because I'm going to talk to you about that. Okay. Versus a 2% commission, it might be treated as a trail or something like that. You okay. have to put the value with the client. And the idea is, is if you're charging a flat fee, okay, the client's going to be putting money out for front. You know how much you're going to get paid and you're going to be happy with that. Okay. So the problem is, is that the cost of living keeps going up. Okay. And the purchasing power of the dollar keeps going down. Yep. And what I want to talk about that a little bit, if it's a good segue into this would be the U S debt clock. But in order to be a financial yeah, planner, you have to have a whole series of exams. And then there was one exam they came out with, cause I was really doing some bang up numbers with ING. I retired from ING and they sent me a note said then 30 days you have to pass this particular exam and if not we're, re we're removing the word planner from all your stationery in your in your office hmm. can you imagine somebody coming to my office with a with a, with a screwdriver and a hammer ply, you know prying off the word planner oh man that was a little bit of pressure so i passed the test um <laughs> there was no option i mean failure was not an option <laughs> yeah you got to do it so anyway, I, the thing is what i'm trying to say is that if somebody is a financial planner they're truly interested in the craft, in the practice, okay? And yep. if somebody's simply a financial advisor, they're in it for the money. They didn't study. And there's a guy out there, he supposedly has a PhD, but it certainly isn't anything that's related to finance. It's related to public policy. And um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about that towards the end of the program. What I'd like to be able to do, folks, is if you have any accounts that you have your metals stored in a depository, um, we're going to talk about that because there is no protection for the assets that are inside a depository. I don't know if you all know that, but uh, you're going to find out a lot of stuff you didn't know. So um, so that's the difference between a financial advisor and financial planner. Being a Falgamir, you're an advisor. If you uh, went through school, got the master's degree and you studied it and everything, and then you kept up with your continuing education credits, you think there are any continuing education credits to be a financial advisor? No, it's well, an easy. No, thing. There, there's not. And here's the other thing with it too: is a lot of even financial planners, I have found it, it it's hard to find one that understands precious metals very well. Um, well, a that's, a, that, into it. that's another problem, okay? Because financial advisors and brokerage firms don't sell physical metal. So if you're going to recommend to somebody to buy physical metal, that's called selling away. And if you're selling away, you get fired for that. So that's like you, Jared. You're working at uh, say a Toyota dealership. No, you're working at a Ford dealership. We're going to pick on Ford okay. today, okay? All right? <laughs> and a nice couple comes in with four children, and they're really having a hard time. And they say, uh, Mr. Jared, we need a new van. I need a minivan to take our kids around. And you know that, gosh, oh, no, those, those Ford vans are just van. pieces of trash. So uh, Jared says, I'm going to be honest with you, folks. You need to go to the Toyota dealership and get yourself, uh, what is that Toyota thing? It's a, it's a Toyota minivan that's very, very reliable. What's the name of that? Yeah, I think it's a Sienna. See, that's right. It is a Sienna. OK, yeah. now, if you recommended to a client that came or customer that came into your Ford dealership to do the best thing and go buy a Toyota Sienna, how long would you have your job there? Uh, not very long. No, you'd have very very, a lot of problems. Yep. So I'm getting some comments to say, Ted, you know, why are you concerned about somebody knocking on your door? Folks, we're you know we're going to be taking other people's lunch away from them. Not a matter of I'm eating it, okay? We're taking it away from other people that need to eat it, okay? And they're eating your retirement funds. There was a couple that sent in a note said they had, they're 88 years of age. Oh my gosh, 88 years of age. You sell them anything, you got you got compliance looking at you. Uh, yeah, so in my sure. case, I was governed by the chief compliance officer. His name is Chris Kokinas at ING Financial Partners, okay, out okay. in Iowa. OK, so everything that I did was looked at very, very carefully. You guys out here in the wild, wild west, you can do whatever you want. They're telling they're giving people tax advice. These are advisors. And it looks like these kids are, uh, you know, maybe a sophomore freshman in high in college. Really? Yeah, yeah. And there's no designations. And these are the people that are getting involved in moving your funds from where you had it to them. And they take a seven percent commission and then pump the uh, the silver into some some uh, uh, repository. While it might be safe going in, is it safe coming out? I mean, it's if safe. you were a thief, yeah. would, would you keep an eye on people? Like, hey, here's a here's a private vehicle going up. Uh, let's keep an eye on the way out, Charlie. Let's see if we can oh. shoot out his tires or something. 
you know, I, I, I was at the post office about two months ago and um, I overheard a lady looking for a, um, a safe deposit box. Mm. And I mentioned something to her and she said she has a ton of silver in the back of her car. Do you right. want to see it? I went back to her car and I saw it and I said, was it a ton? <laughs> we are talking probably um, five to ten thousand dollar, five to ten thousand face of junk silver mm. and um, Morgan About dollars. 000. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then she had a suitcase full of hundred ounce bars. And I said, you need to she just got it from a, a relative that passed away. And um, I said, if you're looking to sell any of this, let me know. I'll try to see if I can help you. But you need to keep this very secure and safe. I took her phone number down. I texted her again. I never heard from her. I don't know what happened. But driving around with that much metals in the back without some kind of a cover on it's not a safe thing. And yeah. it's the same thing if you're coming out of a place. But before we get to that, because I do want to get into a little bit more of um, today, I do want to hit, is it safe to put metals into a depository, right? If you have a retirement account or if you have a personal account, I do have some metals that are in a, in a, in a vaulting facility. So I'd love to help people understand what some of that risk is and see if I'm crazy for doing that. <laughs> well, I'm a lot more conservative than you may be, but uh, I don't like anybody between me and my money at this point in time. We got two, yeah. we got a warring government right now. Do you think the United States is at war? Uh, I think we've been at war for a very long time. Okay. There's an old saying in times of war, do not hold the script of a warring government. Okay. It's yeah. our government that is at war. It's not you and I. I mean, you're sitting here. I'm sitting here. I'm warm. You're happy. I mean, I've been fed today. <laughs> Probably a little bit too much on my side. But at any rate, um, the thing is, is that you never hold the script of a warring government. When the war is over, okay, the money you want to hold, the currency is issued against the money. If yep. you're holding the money, you got the king's keys to the castle. Yep. But you have to hold it. Don't don't let somebody else hold your money. That gone, if you have to, put a soft mattress over top, stack all the monster boxes 20 deep or whatever, put a mattress over top, put some sheets down on it, and fall asleep. With a gun so, this is what people think money is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is what people think money is. Oh, that's interesting. I'm glad you did that. Let's take a look is this, at that. Is this money? I, I want to, you guys put a one in the chat if you think this is money. And also, we, we've got 72 in here, we've got 32 likes. You guys start hitting that thumbs up. Come on, this is for Ted. We're trying to get Ted out there and help him out. But this yeah, I, is I this money. Put a one in if you think no it's money. money. Yeah. A two if you think it is not money and it's just script. I got a question, though, for you, Jared. Yes. Would you take a look at the very top line of your $5 bill there and tell me what that says? Federal Reserve Notes. Got it. Okay. Now, now, your screen is not... Is, you're not entering the twilight zone. What does the top line of this zoom in on yours real quick here? Got it. What does the top line of that say? United States note. That's a little different. Hold, hold it. Hold it. This one says what? Federal Reserve. And this note. one says what? This one says United States note. You know, I learned something a long time ago, but spelled differently. It's different. Okay. So what is the difference? Well, this was issued by the United States Treasury, and this was issued by a private company called the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS. Jared, mm -hmm. is it okay we switch over to that screen now? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So, so folks, what I'd like you to do, if you've got a computer in front of you, I'd like you to pull up your computer and go to bis.org. Okay. And I can't see what they're pulling up right now, but I pulled it up on my second uh, monitor here. And what I'd like you to do is go to bis.org. Okay. Then come down on the gray search bar. Do you see that where it says central bank hub? Are you with me? So just a second, I've got to get it up here. Uh, there's just one technicality. It'll, we'll have it fixed just a second here. Folks, if you're back home, go to bis.org and walk along with me, okay? It's very important. You want to know who owns everything in the world? It's the Bank for International Settlements. And why is that? Because the Bank of International Settlements provides all the fiat currency around the globe. They've had a complete monopoly on the issuance of currency. You probably know it as money for over 100 years. And what you're witnessing right now is a Goliath battle between Keynesian economics and Austrian economics. And guess who's winning? The one that always wins in the end. Austrian monetary economics always wins in the end. Keynesian economics is all about fractional reserve banking. You deposit $1,000 in a bank. And if the reserve liquidity ratio is 10%, then that bank can lend out 90% of that amount. Yep. And then that $900 can be, 90% of that can be lent out at $810 to the next bank, the next bank, the next bank. So you yep. worked hard to make $1,000, Jared. You put that in the bank. 
And now how many people have the same claim to the thousand dollars as you? Uh, there's at least nine people. That's at right. Least. And That's here's right. the thing. When I go to the bank and I want to pull out money, if I try to pull out pull more out than 5,000. Pull out they, what? If I try to go to the bank and pull out more than $5,000 in fiat. There we <laughs> go. Let's call it what it is. Can we? All right. So if I, if I do that, over 5,000, they start asking me questions. Over 10,000, I basically have the Spanish Inquisition all over me. You know why? And you know why? There's because the, it doesn't because exist. There's $12, they don't have very much dollars, there's $12 trillion in deposits in the Federal Reserve yeah. System. And there's only $1.2 trillion in printed currency notes. It's not even created, folks. So you're working for something that hasn't even been represented yet. Now, your labor is represented. It certainly was spent, okay? But you don't have anything tangible to show for it. Everything we're telling you here is true, okay? And the Bank for International Settlements, they own it all. So let's go back up here and take your cursor and go up to the central bank hub in that gray search bar up there, okay? Folks, if you're back home, please go watch along. Probably going to be the most informational uh, three minutes you're ever going to see. Okay, so we're here now. Where else should we go? Then what you do is you drop down to central bank and monetary authority websites. Do you see that? Yep. Got it. Now, Jared, what I'd like you to do is give me a letter of the alphabet, one A through Z, but don't use the letter U right now, okay? Okay. Any letter. Let's, let's get a, We're going to do um, F. F. Okay. I clicked on F, and what I have is, I like Fiji. Ever been to Fiji? Fiji's no, I need Fiji, to Finland, and France. The only three countries that are sovereign in the on the face of the planet, and they own all three banks. Oh, banks? No, banking systems. Okay. So That's the federal the Reserve Bank of Fiji, okay, might have 10 different banks in it. Like we have PNC and Bank of America and Wells Fargo and Chase and you know, all that. Okay. That is a bank. The Federal Reserve Bank owns all the banks, and the owner of all the banks is who? The BIS.org. And, and who owns, owns the BIS.org? The 13 families. Uh, and I actually had a there's chance. There's the key right there yeah. that people don't talk about very often, but it's very true. Uh, it's actually very dangerous. I, uh, yeah. I had a meeting yesterday with a high-end guy, and um, I saw his black card that's used, and it's, it's very de- uh, demonic. And I sat with him, and then he told me some things that I wasn't quite aware of, and I called a doctor <laughs> friend of mine and asked him if that was true. And uh, it, it's actually horrible. I have the recordings of some of the different conversation pieces. He wouldn't allow me to record all of it, but I was able to sure. record some rather salient points. But some of the things that he said were absolutely you know, drop, mic drop moments. He said, yeah. if, you're, if you're saving in anything other than gold and silver, you're saving in paper. So yeah. if you had an ounce of gold and I have a piece of paper, will you accept that piece, that piece of paper for an ounce of gold? Uh, nope. Suppose it had ink on it. Would you accept it if it had ink on it? Nope. Oh, you wouldn't? Suppose I wrote a check on a piece of paper because I had the ink in certain places on the piece of paper and wrote it out to you. Would you accept it then? Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do this again. This is fun. <laughs> I don't get to laugh very often. I mean, this is a pretty um, serious stuff we're talking about here, but that was a good one. What, what what happens when you digitize it and you tokenize it on a blockchain? You, you make it go in, infinite, okay? Because um, it, it, so the, the dollar isn't infinite now. I mean, is there any no. is there any limit to how much debt they can create? But but Jared, is there a number of hours that you have in the day that you can work? There are. There's a finite amount of hours. Yes. You were used a great word. You know, folks, I'm just meeting Jared here for the first time. Met several other people, and of course, in 27 years, I come across a lot of people. Jared's pretty sharp. That's why I wanted to come on his show here. And uh, I think he deserved the platform because well, I'm going to be offering all your all your viewers an oh. option uh, for a couple of things we're going to be doing here later on the show. But Jared, okay, very awesome. good answer. So the, the real money is finite, but what they're paying you in is infinite. So let me ask you a question. Think about it. This is the question that I asked the guy yesterday from the Illuminati. I said, and he couldn't answer it. I said, if you could create any currency in any denomination on the face of the planet, how would you quantify your wealth? Let me ask it again. Yeah. If you could create any currency in any denomination in any country, like the BIS can, okay? Yeah. How would you quantify your wealth in something infinite or something finite? Uh, the person creating that's going to do it in the finite. Very good. Folks, 
you got an ace here. I mean, he's really on it. Okay. All right. So finite. So what has been used that's finite for money for thousands of years? I mean, what did G Judas get? What did Judas get paid to drop the dime on Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Silver. 30 pieces, right? Yep. Yeah. And then what did Judas wind up doing with that? He felt really bad about dropping the dime on Jesus. So what he did was he saw, uh, he went out to Potter's Field where the potters would throw the broken, um, you know, pots when they Pottery, yeah. play pots and stuff. Right. Okay. And uh, hung himself. So yep. the bottom line to hear, folks, is that money has been around for thousands of years, but you've been brainwashed to accept pieces of paper called script, okay, as payment for your labor. Now, let me show you something here. Can you guys see this? Okay. These are currency examples throughout history. Not history, but you know, certainly the pieces of paper that I have. But what I want to show you here is look at this one here. Okay. I collect foreign currencies. Look at this. Look how nice it is. Look, look how nicely it folds up, though. Okay, look. Yeah, this. that's okay. more convenient than silver, right? Well, Just it certainly weighs less. Okay, <laughs> give me your silver less. to me, and I'll issue you pieces of paper. You trust me? There you go. <laughs> anyway, anyway, my point is this: at some point in time, somebody worked and exchanged their labor for this piece of paper, and this piece of paper at that time could buy them a meal, or maybe seal, seal, uh, feed their family, or pay rent, or whatever else, pay the taxes, or what have you, right? Why am I holding this now? It's obviously real, right? Because it folds together. You want to pick another one? You want to pick this one here? Okay. Or this yep, one here? Colorful. Like, yeah, the more colorful, the better, I think. Oh, okay. And even All when right. they have foil, right. if there's foil on there, it's more important. Okay. Look how worn this one is, folks. Look at this one. Has that been used? Look how this folds up. Some. Oh, boy. We got to have a bigger camera here. Nick is uh, trying to get us something. Uh, it's, it's a whiteboard. Okay. okay. And uh, it allowed Love me it. to stand up and do math for people and show them all kinds of stuff. But anyway, at some point in time, people carried this around their back pocket. You can see the perspiration, the stain doesn't really smell that nice. But it did, <laughs> look, some, it. <laughs> they put some, uh, look at this, they put some tape up here to keep it together or whatever. Yeah, okay. you go. But this was used to buy food or keep people alive or pay taxes or whatever. Okay. Why am I holding it now? And what is it worth now? It isn't worth anything. What's the difference between this and a dollar? Because as I'm showing you here, folks, there are literally two over 2,000 examples of failed fiat currency, and they all fail in the same fashion. So don't go thinking I'm saying like some savant or whatever that's able to figure out what's going to happen to the dollar. No, it always runs this way. So you're seeing the price of gasoline go up. I paid 409 for diesel the other day. I used to pay 99 cents a gallon. So has the diesel fuel become worth that much more? Or has the currency oh. become worth that much less? Are you with me? Yeah, it's become way less. I, I don't have a I don't have any constitutional silver or junk silver with me right now. But let me let me show you another example here. Yes, this is another example. They printed so many of these oh, rich marks. Like okay, yep. there you go. But, but look at this. I'm not making this up. Watch this. What's on the back? Nothing. Nothing. They started running out of ink. I'm not kidding you. They started running. They were printing so much of this stuff. They were running yeah. out of ink. Okay. In our particular case, they don't even bother to print it anymore. It's just digits on a computer screen. That's how you get paid. So wow, think incredible. of what you're being paid in as receipts for money. The money is the silver. The money is the American silver eagles that we're holding here. Okay. It's probably been a long time, if ever, you've had $10,000 sat on your lap. $10,000 weighs about 40 some pounds. So if you get yourself a monster box of American silver eagles, that used to cost $10,000 and now $16,000. Is that because the silver went up or because of the value of the dollar went down? What do you think, Jared? I think the value of the, the, value I, I of the think, dollar went down. So I how think does the Constitution yeah. define a dollar for us? Let's get out the Constitution and let's okay. open it up to Article 1, Section 10. Article 1, Section 10. Okay? You with me? Yep. I'm going to move my hand up here. Can you tell me what this says there? No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, emit bills of credit, make anything other than gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. That's what the Constitution says, right? So, so what the uh, framers yeah. of our Constitution yeah. knew that our money was going to be inflated around to nothing because it's been happening throughout history, okay? What happened with the Roman army? Why did Rome fall? Rome fall because they had all these kinds of soldiers out all over the place and they started debasing the money that they were paying the soldiers with. 
So the money didn't have the amount of gold and silver that was supposed to have in it. So they cheated people. We got cheated in 1965. In 1965, they stole our money from our money because the Constitution, if you read further enough, it says at $1, 371.25 grains of silver. What yep. happened to the silver in our coins? It is completely gone. So how did we know there was silver in certain coins here in the United States? They put ridges called reeds around the outside. Now, why did they put the ridges around the outside as opposed to a nickel or a penny? Uh, because well, if you try to shave off some of the metal around the outside, yeah. you'd be able to tell it real quick, right? Yep. So what they would, you ever heard the term point shaving? Not point. I've heard of clipping. I have not heard of point shaving. In a basketball game or football game or whatever. You ever heard of a big, any kind of sport contest where, yeah, they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, clipping or um, uh, shaving, point shaving, miss a point or whatever to make. You ever heard about that kind of stuff happening? Yep. OK. All right. Same kind of thing here. So what we did was we put reeds around the outside edges so you couldn't uh, take away the outside metal. But a long time ago, they would take a, a measured ball of gold or silver and put it in a round die. OK. And the other guy would come around. The die would be on the other side and he would strike this die down on the other path like this. And the bottom side would take up whatever the indentation is. And the top side would take up whatever the indentation is in the metal there. Okay. But the outside edges would look sort of flowery, like cauliflower or something. So what they would do, the guys would do is they'd take a handful of these things and gradually sort of round them out, make them look nice. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the pre-measured ball of, of, of money. I mean, here, here's, here's a point that is being made, maybe not intentionally. The people that did that understood the real value of money. They understood what was in there. And because of that, they were shaving it. They yes. were taking a little bit off. They, they knew what it all out in 1965, though, didn't they, Jerry? There you go. Yeah. Also, what else happened in 1965? Wasn't silver up to that time counted as an asset on the United States Treasury balance sheet? Yes, I it believe was. so. Yep. It was. So what happened in 1965? Who stole the money? Where is it? Do you think it just disintegrated? No, it's somewhere. Who has it? That's what I want to know. That's what inquiring minds want to know. What Ted, do you, do you have it somewhere? Are you hiding that somewhere? Uh, not on me. <laughs> not on me. <laughs> I am now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, folks, this is cash is trash. Do you follow uh, Robert Kiyosaki? You yes. Rich dad, poor dad. Yep. Okay. Yep. Smart guy. Okay. Look, all these currency notes, they're all around the world, folks. The dollar is no different. Okay. So. This one's actually had a little bit of wear. Some of these things are actually quite pretty. Look at this one here. Okay. Yeah, that has a lot of color to it. It does. Yeah. You got this one here. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. You know, some of these, I, I think it's cool that you have them because it's history. It shows mm -hmm. some creativity that was, was done. And I'm assuming you picked these up for hardly any money. Well, our group is holding over 1,760 monster boxes. We know what the hell's going on. So the places that we get them, they, uh, <laughs> we don't mess around. We know what's happening, and I, we're not stupid, okay? So at any rate, uh, take a look at this one here. Oh, let me so zoom in on that one. where we go. Here. This one is from Ecuador. Okay. okay. Look at this one here. That one's pretty Isn't cool. interesting? Yeah. So we all remember what happened with uh, prior to the Euro, right? France had the franc. Holland had the kroner, okay? What happened to the franc and the kroner? What happened, what happened to the Italian lira? What happened to the Italians that were holding Italian lira? I'm guessing they're lira? only on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have all of them. <laughs> but I was on a bus with a guy, and he was from Germany. And I had okay. a serious conversation with him. I said, look, I said, were you in Germany before the, uh, the euro came in? He said, yeah. I said, when the euro came in, how long did they give you to take your, your marks, your German marks, and trade them in for the, uh, for the euro? And he said, the first day, one to one. The second day, okay. two to one. The third day, three to one. And then the door was closed. But what if they were swapping? That's, fast. That's a lot faster than I, I thought they'd give them a couple months or something like that. Well, I, it may have been. I was just talking but, to the guy in the back of the bus. That sounds fast. That sounds really fast. Yeah, It did sound fast to me, but uh, I'm only telling you what I, what I was told. But I, I can't vouch for that because I don't know uh, exactly what happened. So... What I'm trying to say, though, folks, is that the silver will be around long after you're dead and gone. This will not. This will be in somebody's hands or it'll be up in smoke. All right. So if you're going to spend finite time doing something that generate uh, money, OK, let's call it money. 
and let's have it make sure that it's finite because there's only a finite number of hours that you can work in a day and a year in your lifetime. Finite, a certain number of hours, right? Well, then why not have something finite to represent the hours that it is that you worked? Spread the word, folks. Yep. Come on, let's wake yep. up. This is what you're being paid with is is script. It's invented by a company, one company called the Bank for International Settlements. Okay, and they come out of uh, Basel, Switzerland, and they pontificate from the mountains. Oh wow, we're going to introduce this or ESG funds. What you ever heard of that? Uh, Environmental get, government and social funds. Don't get me started on the ESG stuff, man. It's it, I, I know I know too much about the ESG stuff. Um, I, I work for a software company, and uh, anyway, software can be used to. Let me put it this way: software is being used, maybe not directly by companies, but by companies that utilize it to create individualized carbon credit scores, and they're planning on introducing those. And that's something that I really don't want to have anything to do with. Who do you have to pay for the carbon credits? Where does that money go? It's going to government, and all the way up, everything we're talking about. It's it, it goes. Maybe did John Kerry in his private jet? Is that where it might go? Possibly. Look at this one that I have here. Look at this one. Okay, let's zoom in on that one. You guys hit that thumbs up if you haven't so far yet. Oh, that, wow. That brought it in really nice and clear. Look at that. See, oh, now what the deal was here, okay, this is a, a silver certificate. The deal was you give the bank silver, they give you this note. You bring this note back, they give you the silver. If I take this note back and give it to the bank, will I get silver today? No. No. Who has the silver? Somebody gave up the silver in order to give it the note in the first place, right? Yep. So banks cannot be trusted, folks. OK, at this point in time, the only people I think you should be trusting is God and the periodic table. Nothing else that okay. calls conservative. <laughs> but when this hits and silver is going to go, it's 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 going to go up above where it's supposed to be. It's called market elasticity. So let's suppose that we got these three hundred and sixty three people you know, all playing musical chairs. Nobody knows where the chair is. The music stops. One person sits down. If you're one of the three hundred and sixty two people sitting on the floor, you're going to want the eagle or the, or the ounce of silver, whatever it is that's in that, that the guy has is sitting in the chair. So don't you see a bidding war happening of the 392 people sitting on the floor saying, hey, I'll give you this. I'll give you that. It's called. They, they totally so, huh? I think we got to take a look at the U.S. debt clock. <laughs> OK, so let's go. To so the I, I think your points you're making right now are perfect. And then just for you guys that are on here right now, just to let you know, we're going to talk about the U.S. debt clock. We're also going to be talking about how to safeguard your money and also for people that are more senior that have had a little bit more time on the earth than myself, uh, how we can help them not be taken advantage of. We are going to hit some of that here today, too. And then one of the things that I do want to talk about, Ted, when we come back after the debt clock is um, I've got a couple of people that are big fans of platinum in here. There's some people that are big fans of gold. Some are big fans of silver. Um, some of them even have cryptocurrencies. And so. You know, one thing that I think is important to kind of address, uh, maybe not the crypto, we'll leave that for another time. But as oh, far I as prefer not to, goes, I prefer not to leave the crypto for another time. OK, we'll, we'll hit that too today. OK, so we'll hit crypto and then <laughs> you better get ready, folks. Get is, the fire extinguishers yeah. ready because I'm going to let go on this one. OK, go we're going to hit that too in a minute. But part of it is some people already have certain kinds of metals in certain forms that they've paid money for. If they move out of it, they're going to take a haircut. I wouldn't suggest you do that. So I want to address that as well today, too, for you guys. So we're going to hit that. And then at the very end, what I'd like to do is see if we could take a little bit of Q&A if we still have some time. Sure. Yep. Okay. My so we're going to do, let, let's hit the debt clock real quick because um, I want to I want to share a few things there. Okay. Go ahead. We've talked about um, the U.S. national debt of $34 trillion. We've talked about the M2 money supply, the total amount of money that can be used to cash the checks by which we're going to add the $621 trillion you got to get that number up there a little bit there, Jared. Can you move it up a little bit, your screen? See the see the right. six hundred twenty one yep. trillion there, folks. You want to do your cursor thing around there, right, right here, guys, in the middle. Okay. So middle what we green. would do, what we take the six hundred twenty one trillion and add that to. Can you come down a little bit because we got to get the the, the thirty four trillion up in the upper left. So we take six twenty one okay, plus yep. the thirty four trillion. That adds up to what to six hundred and fifty five trillion dollars. And that is represented by 20 trillion that's in the M2 money supply. So if you owed $621, but only had $20 in checking account, are you solvent? No. no. Folks, we have friends in high places. One of them is inside the FDIC. And I'm telling you, um, I speak to him pretty much daily. 
uh, he, he doesn't tell me exactly what's happening because he don't want to lose his job. But um, I asked him, I said, Tom, what's happening now is, is you guys supposedly don't have the money. I mean, the amount of money you have in your diff, it's called the, the deposit insurance fund. Deposit yep. insurance fund is what's called a diff, okay, where the, all the funds are that's going to supposed to be used to back up a failing bank. It's an, it's an insurance company, federal deposit insurance company, right? Yep. So why are they collecting premiums from the banks if, in fact, the insurance company doesn't have the ability to create the currency that would be required in order to uh, reimburse a lossie and the result of an insured claim? Do you understand what I said? So what? <laughs> One more time. Right. But right. I'm okay. pretty close. They, right. Basically, okay. they don't print the they don't print the FDIC does not print the money. The Federal Reserve does. That's right. So if the federal if the FDIC does not have the cash to cover a claim, why are they charging premiums to the member banks? Mic drop. I, I'm assuming now that's they, how they they're funding the FDIC. Yeah, but but what are they paying for? It's nice that you're funding the FDIC. You can fund me too. I'm not, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, so the thing is, is that so I said, Tom, why are they paying insurance premiums for a product that can't be insured? Good point. <laughs> you know, I have a way of being able to ask the questions. That one question it's, I said, if you could create any currency in any denomination on the face of the planet, this guy was uh, he was pretty high up there. And he was actually a little pissed that he couldn't answer the question. He said, what do you mean? He said, we can create whatever currency we want, wherever we want. They actually have their own printer. <laughs> you can believe it or not believe it. I looked the guys in the eye. You didn't. OK, <laughs> I believe this guy's 100 percent true. He knows what I know. And I think I may know a little bit more than he knows, which is why he wants to get together with us again. So I, he's asked me, ask me that question again. He had time about five minutes later. He asked me to repeat the question. And I said, and this is a good thing for you, too. OK, Yep. well, if you could create. Any currency on the face of the planet, all 209 that you saw up there in the uh, in the in the bis.org, okay, yep. all those countries. If you could create any currency in any country in any denomination, how would you quantify your wealth? You can't quantify it in power because you can make them use the currency, right? Yep. You, but what happened though is Rothschild actually cornered the stock market back during when water when uh, when Napoleon was breaking through. Remember the Battle of Waterloo? Remember hearing about that? Well, yep. Rich, what yep. Rothschild was on the floor of the London stocking stock exchange, and he had lied. He had he had a pigeon come across, or actually the note from a pigeon, and it said that um, that uh, Napoleon had broken through the lines at Waterloo. Okay, yep. so they're breaking through the lines, and all the traders are there. So, oh my gosh, he's going to come into into London. He's going to ruin the stock market. We want to sell. So Rothschild was back there, and he's watching the prices drop and drop and drop, and he starts buying and buying and Biden. Buying the stocks because they're going down. Okay. So then he starts running out of cash and he reaches out to his other four brothers because they had all set up central banks and all around the world. Yep. They're yep. now. Okay. And he said, Hey, I got a bank run going on here, a, a stock run going on here right now. I need whatever cash you got. So he basically bought all the shares because he manipulated the price of the stock down because he lied and said that, that uh, Napoleon had broken through the lines. Folks, this is true. You go out and do your own research. Okay? There, there's facts. That, that is facts. You guys can research that. And that's all. Well, I, it's not all over the place, but it is out there. You can find it. Yep. OK. So as so as uh, now Rothschild's got pretty much all the stock and the traders are starting to get ready to leave the, the trading floor. And guess what he did? He announced that it was a lie. Oh, they were able to repel him back. Okay, so now, now Napoleon is going back to the line. He's being pushed back. Okay, what did the traders want to do? Oh they want to buy the stock back, right? They all, they're the stock, all back right? in. They're, out on the stock. they're buying it. It's going to the moon. It's going. It, it, it's diamond ha paper hands going diamond hands for you, crypto people. Absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. So, do you think Rothschild sold any of the stock back? No. No, no. I, I bet he. I, I. They probably hold some of it still if those companies they, are. Around. They do. And they hold it because they want to be the, the lender of last resort to the crown. Yep. As a matter of fact, yep. Rothschild once is quoted as one saying, give me the ability to control a country's currency and I care not what laws it makes. That's why all our lawyers, uh, not lawyers, all our politicians are simply puppets because it's the money that they get on top of the salary they're paid by us. OK, that they're really in for the juice. But that's not it either. They get up. They get stock tips, illegal stock tips up front, like Nancy Pelosi was able to organize a bill which crashed the stock and she knew what was going to go. So she shorted it. So she made what twelve million dollars in like twelve. The million fact years. that the fact that Martha Stewart can go to jail for that and 
politicians can go from $100,000 net worth to $100 million net worth is a massive problem. I think we're talking about a two-tiered justice system here, aren't we? But uh, I also not, think yeah, I mean, totally, totally. I think we're looking at a two-tiered financial system. According yep. to this guy last night that I met with, what we're being paid with has absolutely no value to them. I actually saw, folks, a life contract that he was offered for $36 billion. And if he'd have signed it, um, it would have been a whole different story. I wouldn't have been talking to him. But taking look at the amount of money that we're talking about, $36 trillion, $32 billion, excuse me, billion dollars, all right? Money, their ability to create this current, it's just numbers on a piece of paper. Actually, not even now. Then you have to use paper using digits on a computer screen, right? So, and so what are, are, we, are, are, we seeing, are they electrons? Where are we seeing are the they, tickers moving? Like nothing's static on this page right now. Uh, yeah. So well, I mean, the, okay, the middle's static because it's it's ratios, but all mm -hmm. the real numbers are moving around. That's an interesting point you bring up. We didn't touch on that. What is the M2 money supply doing? Is it going up, going down, or staying the same? Uh, let's look at it. Um, it is going down. Right. So the amount of money that you, that's in the bank account, in your checking account, by which to cash your check against is going down, right? Yeah, it's going down by a thousand per. Actually, it looks like it's going down. 50 to 100,000 per second here. Well, that's, a, that's a lot. I, that's, that's more than I lot. make per second, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, second. <laughs> what is happening to the currency and, and uh, credit derivatives now? What is happening to that number? Is it going up, going down, or staying the same? That one is that one's going up. It's going up almost as fast as the it's going down over here. So we got quite a spread happening here, huh? Yeah, oh, we have, we're not we done have yet. a divergence that is growing. It's almost uh, an acceleration, you might say. So if you want to get out, you got to get out before the six, the 20 trillion is gone, right? Oh, way before. If that. you want to get out of the stock market, you got to get out while the 20 trillion is, still has a piece of that 20 trillion to honor your check, right? Totally. Yep. Got it. Now let's go up to the upper left because the game ain't over yet. Is that U.S. debt clock, uh, the U.S. national debt, is that going up, going down or staying the same? Uh, that is going up. Right. So we have the liabilities against the dollar going up and the number of dollars that you can redeem those liabilities against going down, which currently is only 3% of the numbers that are going up. Does anybody see a problem here? Or am I smoking hopium? Oh, I think people are seeing it. We're starting to get some good comments in here too. And, you know, one of the things I want to point out too, Ted, to everybody. Again, what is the value? Uh, can you, what is the value? I got a lot, a lot of this stuff. What is, your stuff is going to be like this, but not my stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah. This is really cool. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I just absolutely love silver. This is just, that's, where's your, where's your, oh, there it is. Well, here, we're going to zoom in. Okay, you're showing silver. We're going to zoom in on you for a minute here. Okay, real quick. Let's see it again. Everybody wants to see silver. Hey, guys, look at that. See, that's money. That'll be around after I'm gone, my children's gone, and my children's children's gone, right? They're still pulling this stuff off the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, Hold it now. On the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. Well, it's got to disintegrate down there, right? Is that what happens to silver and salt water there, Jared? Uh, it will it will tarnish the side that's facing the ocean. But what is tarnish? Tarnish uh, is the attraction of uh -huh. what? It's oxidization on the outside. That's correct. That's correct. Yep. So if it oxidizes, and let's suppose we had some kind of atomic uh scale, yeah, very, very uh, uh, um, sensitive scale. As silver tarnishes, does the atomic weight go up, go down, or stay the same? Uh, technically, it would go up because there's That's some right. stuff on the outside of it that has, that has right. grown or basically attached itself. Right. Okay. So one another way to get rid of this, the tarnish, I don't know if your listeners know about this because um, I do it. Take your, uh, take your silver and put it in a, an aluminum foil lined pan, Okay. Put your silver in it, fill it up with water, bring it up to a boil, okay? And then sprinkle uh, baking soda on top of it. Yep. It'll it'll release a, a tremendous stench. I did a, I did a short video that's like 20 seconds on that. And, doesn't take uh, long, does it? It doesn't take long, but the person in the video, it's it's Trax New York or New York Tra Trax New York. He, that guy's, I'm going to have to show you a link to his channel one of these days. He's got over a couple million subscribers and he hands out gold and silver in New York City downtown. And he has a big jewelry store, but- he does crazy things. Start. <laughs> We're going to go to New York and get yeah, some. Yeah, I'm going to New York too. 
He'll, How much is enough? You know, the there. answer to that a little yeah. bit more. <laughs> there you go. So he'll he'll actually take out bars, uh, and um, when he puts the bars out there, he will uh, he'll ask people, "Would you rather have a thousand dollars or a gold bar?" Mm-hmm. And when someone takes the thousand dollars, he says, "You're an idiot." What are you thinking? And he goes, how many gold bars does he give away? I'm standing in that line. We're talking like 10, like 10 gold bars on this video. But here's the thing. When he, when someone decides to take the, the, the fiat dollar instead of the, the money, the gold money, mm-hmm. he throws up another thousand dollars in the air away from that person to represent. You just blew a thousand dollars. This isn't Mark Dice you're talking about, is it? No. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. Somebody else. All right. Okay. But Mark, Mark Dice is, he'll do some cool stuff. He's not, you know, he'll do some stuff too. But mm. um, I do have a couple of videos you'll have to check out at some time in the future where I go on but, to the. Can Peter. we address the issue of bars real quick, though? Yeah, let's okay. do it. Okay. All right. So people are buying bars, and uh, unfortunately, some are being conned into sending it someplace else. Okay. Let's suppose you hold the bar, though. Okay. You're holding this bar and uh, it may have a number on it. Okay. And, or it may not. And now it's time for you to, you want to sell that bar. Where are you going to take it? You're going to take it to the grocery store and use it to buy some milk? I'm going to have to take it to a coin shop. That's right. Let me tell you the laws. Or heaven forbid, a pawn shop. But yeah. It doesn't matter which place you take it to. This this is the way it works. Okay. If the place that you're taking the bar back to sell it or redeem it is not the place that you bought it. Okay. Okay. That means they don't have a record of that particular bar having been purchased by you. Okay. You can't see my hands too well here. I'm going to turn it down this way. There we go. Okay. So what they have to do is pay the guy for the bar or girl, and it has to sit in their safe between eight and 14 days. Why? Because they have to file a complete uh, police report to find out whether or not the bar was stolen. The, you, those of you that bought bars and hadn't seen them, have you checked to see whether or not your bars are stolen? We're going to touch on that in a little minute. So at any rate, how much money do you think that the dealer is going to give you for that silver bar that say 10 gram, 10 ounces, okay, 230 bucks, 240 dollars, whatever. What, how much of that 240 dollars do you think he's going to give you out of his own pocket? Because if that bar turns out to be stolen, he's out. It goes back to its rightful owner. So how much are they going to give you for the bar? Besides, they may not know that the bar's solid. Do you know it's solid? Have you done a drill on it? Have you found out whether or not what's inside the bar is actually silver? Folks, you got one shot at this. And I have a friend that just earned the money already made. Come on now. Really? You got to wake up. I had a friend that did a gravity test on the outside of his kilo. This is what you're being paid in. And you're going to wind up with nothing. Yep. But here's the thing. People are doing things like a Sigma, um, Sigma, Sigma machine to test it. And they're also doing magnets on it to test gravity. You guys, that's just testing the outside silver content of the bar. It is not testing the inside. You need an x-ray to be able to know that. Or even better, you have to drill into it to take core samples and, to see if the there's anything. And the person going to sell your stuff to in exchange for this bar, they're going to have all that equipment. They're going to accept it just as easily as they would accept from me an American Silver Eagle against your bar. If you have a one gram bar and I have a, a, an American Silver Eagle and we go in to buy something, who walks out with it, you or me? Well, if it's silver and I know it's verified, I'm walking out with the silver. There you go. So, but what I'm saying is, we're both going to compete for the same thing. It's, maybe it's a, a nice bowl or something, a crystal bowl. Okay, I come in with an American silver eagle, and you come in with a bar. Who are they going to sell the? Who are they going to sell the bowl to? No, they're going to they're going to take the eagles, or I'm going to have to come up with more stuff with my bar. Okay, all right, good. So here we are. Okay, so then, what is most important when you purchase your silver? The price that you're paying or the amount that it's worth when it's time to use it? it technically, it's the amount that it's worth when you go to use it. Yes. Uh, when you buy silver is important as well. You try to get the best possible price you can. However, I think a lot of people are splitting hairs over a couple bucks here and there. It's, it, it's, you're being pound wise and, full, and uh, penny wise and pound foolish. Okay. Yep. Because you need to have that unit that you're going to use to pay for as widely recognized as possible. Now, some of you out there being sold $50,000 ounce coins because it's stamped a particular way. Look, go to the U.S. debt clock. This is very interesting. You probably won't see this anywhere else. Can you go onto that U.S. debt clock? And what I'd like you to do is go to, um, let's see. I think it it might be time machine. Let me see. Hold on a minute. I'll tell you. Oh, no. I'm sorry. It's down at the bottom. It's down at the bottom. Down at the bottom, what I want you to do is click on um, gold supply demand. Okay. All right. 
Now, tell me how you think countries are are valuing their worth. The amount of credit unit, the amount of currency units they can create against the money, which is the gold and silver, or do you think they value the country's net worth on the number of tons that they hold? Jared, take a shot at this one. It's going to be well. They're going to value it based on how many tons they hold, because that's what oh, at the end of oh, the day. Oh, you mean they it's not going to value it more because it's stamped a particular way? Oh, we got these coins stamped <laughs> this way. Look how this one's much prettier than that one, folks. No. Get real. Come on, stop being stupid with this stuff. I'm getting involved in here because it's wild, wild west out there right now. I came up from a very, very regulated industry, and I thought I'd put my toe in here and sort of help people understand what money is. So a lot of you have gotten back to me and said, oh, this is what happened. Ted, awesome that I found you. One right off the bat. We, Hubby and I, turned $200,000 in silver on November 21st, sent to a depository in Texas, had medical problems, and had to cash a small amount in for medical bills. folks." This is not a financial plan. These charlatans took all the daggone money this older couple had. They're 88 years of age. It's completely inappropriate. Okay? It, 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 I, would, I would be censored. So we're going to talk about this because I'm very upset over this. And okay. I would like for you to vote for me to be mayor. I'm going to take on this challenge myself, but I need your help. I'm already swimming around in the water. I've already gotten bit by a snake. I mean, not a, a, a shark. James called me in my former OSJ, Office of Supervisional Jurisdiction at ING. He says, Ted, what are you out there talking about QCIPs for? He's mad because he understands that once people understand that what they hold, they don't own, like the, what the, what's it called, the, 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 the emperor's new clothes or something? Yep. The water goes out. What are you actually holding? You're not holding anything. See, you used to hold it, and I used to do this, and that's why I'm doing it right now. I'm out trying to make retribution for what yep. I did. These are actual stock certificates. See how beautiful they are? Do you have any of these now? No. I don't, but I used to. I used to, That's but right. I don't because I turned, you turned them, them into them the guys like me. And what we did, yep. we turned them into our back office, which is computer share. Can you give me a full screen there just a minute? I want to share Yes, I can. Yep. Okay, look. <laughs> okay. Do you, uh, there we go. Do you see this number here? Okay. Do you see that? Yes. That's a certificate. That is, what, that is what's called a unique identifier. That is a stock certificate that belongs to this guy, DuPont, okay, for this number of shares, okay? Put down here, okay? All right? So he holds this. It's tangible. And this is the serial number of the stock certificate that he holds with the number of stocks on it, okay? Now, this is another one here, okay? This is a unique identifier up here for 100 shares of stock was issued to, who was this one issued to? Norman Gordon. You see this, right? Okay. Yep. You don't have anything tangible. More importantly, you don't have any unique identifiers for the stock certificate you think you own. So if there's no unique identifier, how many times can the same stock certificates be sold over and over again? Let's suppose Jared and I are, we're going to, we're going to go in together. We're going to buy this, this uh, very, very beautiful car. You're never going to be able to drive it. You can say that it's yours, but you can't touch it much like a share of stock, right? Yep. can't say that. Right. Okay. So, the thing is, is that uh, I say to Jared, you know, hey, Jared, you know what? If we file off the VIN number of this car, we can sell this same car to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, right? So what does the represent? What does the VIN number represent to the car? A unique identifier. Yep. Without the unique identifier, do you own that car, this car, or whatever else? So what I'm going to suggest, folks, if your money's in depository, possession's nine-tenths of the law. I would suggest you get control of your own money and regardless what it takes, get it in your hands now. We're not in a collapse situation just yet. I believe we're close. I don't know when it's going to happen. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a soothsayer or something like that. <laughs> I'm just working, but I'm telling you the truth as far as what happens to currencies and everything through history. They all go back to their intrinsic value, which is whatever it can boost in, in the way that it's burned. Okay. It will produce a little bit of calories in terms of the heat that it might give off from this. Okay. But the bottom line is, is that you need to be holding the money of your country. If you're in, if you're in Canada, you want to be holding the silver leaf. In the United States, you want to be holding the, the American silver eagle. If you're in England, you want to be holding the, the Britannia, right? And um, uh, if you're in uh, South Africa, you want to be holding the rand. You don't want to be holding the script of a, a warring government. And right now, you should be holding the money because the new money that's going to be issued is going to be issued against a new currency that's going to be issued 
It's going to be issued against the money. If you're holding the money, you're holding... <laughs> If you hold the gold, you make all the rules. He who holds so, the gold makes the so rules. Ted, what do you what do you think about like uh, silver buffalo uh, rounds? It's not money. It's an investment, but it's not money. See, I no. prefer the maximum utility and maximum fungibility. So when I see something that I need or want, I want to be able to go and get it and leave. You guys are going to have to fight over Is it real? Is that big? Oh, this has a scratch in it. Ted comes up with, with American silver eagles or junk dimes or whatever. I'm in, I'm out, and I get exactly what I want. And if you guys even try to bid with me, I'll outbid you. I'm going to get what I want because I did it right. And, and this is not big... concerned about what you pay for it. Be more concerned about what it's worth when you need it. Does that make sense? It it totally does. And I think it's a huge point that doesn't get driven home enough on stacking channels. I can't drive it any deeper. I mean, I'll break the glass on my table. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But, but here, here's the point. What's happening is a lot of people are going after, um, and you guys, by the way, this is an option, right? You can do whatever you want with your with your money, with your fiat, turn it into to metals sure. here, right? Yeah. So that's up to you to make that choice. I can't tell you exactly what to do, but I will make a point here. And I've made this to other people. Um, if you go out and spend $26, let's say, for a silver round versus 30 bucks for an eagle, and the stuff hits the fan and things start going down, and you present to someone to buy a, a pound of rice for a for a silver round or coin, and there's two people that show up. This is exactly what Ted's talking about. And one has that eagle, and one has that silver round. Which person do you think's walking away with that pound of rice? It's going to be the one with the eagle. Now, if there happens to be two people with eagles, there may become a little bit of a bidding war where you may have to go a little higher if with I it. I really want, and I'll throw a dime on the table. You throw I'll a dime on the dime. table. <laughs> but, but here's the thing: I think too many people are looking at it just based this on is weight. Fun. Yeah, well, it is fun. So I think so. I think too many people are looking just based on weight. It's only going to be weight, and I can guarantee you guys, Libertads right now are more expensive than an American Silver Eagle for a reason because there's a preference out there, and there's certain buyers that want those. That uh, seems we put, I, I gotta break in here. I, I'm yeah. sorry. I gotta break in here. Okay. Yep. Because a long time ago there was something called the Holland Toilet Ball Mania. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> this is crazy. These these people over there, they thought it was really neat to collect different bulbs that put out tulips. Okay. I'm not kidding, folks. People invested in this, like you guys are invested in this stuff, or yeah. you're investing in proxies of this, of which there are thousands of owners for each one. Okay. All right. Oh, man, you get me all worked up. Where were we with this? <laughs> Trade of thoughts, John. Oh, yeah, okay, know. so so here's where we were. So I, I think you made a very good point. Buying silver rounds is an investment. It's not actually a currency. Well, it's not even a currency. It's not money. Okay, let's use the right definition. Mm -hmm. If I buy constitutional or junk silver right now, it's still money, guys. It has a denomination for the United that's States right. government if the United States is still around. Now, technically, that's the same with Morgan and Peace dollars. The issue you run into with Morgan and Peace dollars is you are paying a pretty hefty premium for the price and of it. And not so, defined in the U.S. tax code. I had the whole tax codes. I really was a hell of an estate planner. <laughs> I was traveled around the <laughs> I was traveling around the country to help educate other estate planners because we did the the full estate planning. We did the uh, we did the revocable living. Focus in on this a little bit, okay? Okay, let's do it. This was our estate planning worksheet that we did. Okay. okay, so clients would fill this out, okay, front and back. All right. I'm sorry, you guys ought to get a look at this because you're ever going to do an estate plan. This is what the intake sheet should look like. Okay. Yep. All right. See that? I might. Okay, now I don't want to put this up on a website because I don't want other estate planners to have access to it. Besides, you already took a look at it, all right? So what we did is we set up revocable living trust. We we avoided probate. We avoided any kind of contention between any of the beneficiaries by putting something in the trust called an interorum clause. You might want to put that up on your website. It's called in is first word I N, terorum T E R R O R E M in terorum clause. Your attorneys don't want to put this in the document. You know why? Because it automatically seals off any type of challenge to it. The only way you can challenge a revocable living trust if you can prove that the testors, the people that created the trust, were incapacitated or mentally compromised at the time they set it up. Then the onus is on the attorney because he drafted a document for somebody that wasn't competent to draft, to sign it. So if you set up a revocable living trust and you have the attorney put in there an interorum clause, which says if anyone chooses to challenge the terms of the trust, they're automatically disinherited. We never had any problems in 27 years. Thousands and thousands of estate plans done. 
because money causes people to go nuts. So what we did is we put it in there and say, hey, mom, hey, dad, I can put something in there that will stop the kids from fighting when the time comes that you pass. I'm going to have also to look and see if mine has that in there. Um, I'm sorry? Just set up I just set up. I will bet you dollars to a donut, okay, that it's not in there because you got to be smart enough to know about it. And then you got to talk to the attorney to putting into it because the attorneys make all their money on the back end. Now, you (laughs) might say, well, dad told you, I understood dad told you to set this up this way. Oh, no, he said he set me up. He wanted it all to go through probate. That's what your dad told me. Oh, my God. No way. See, probate commissions in the state of Maryland are 9% of the, you better write this down, daggone it. Because you're not going to hear this anywhere else. And the probate commissions are different in each state. Yep. In the state of Maryland, it's 9% of the first $20,000, which is $1,800. And then 3.6% of the gross value thereafter. So let's suppose you leave behind a house, but it has a $100,000 loan on it. The $100,000 loan is part of the gross estate by which the probate taxes and probate fees are assessed against. I didn't believe this. It takes a lot to convince me of anything. So I went down to the courthouse. I said, how do I check this out? The Ted, go down to the courthouse, check it out for yourself. He said, you might mean to tell me I'm going to go down to the courthouse and ask for the last 10 wills that are probate and they're going to give them to me. Yeah, because it's public property. Mm. Interesting. Now they have a probate worksheet. This is going to floor you. This is why I got into estate planning. Because the amount of money that's taken from people's estate at the time of their death is absolutely obscene. 30 and 40% of the net value gone because there's nobody there to watch this, watch the kitchen. Mm. If, however, and that's because you're putting it through the probate system by having the attorneys and everything probated for you, change the title to everything after you're already dead. Is, and is this before or after a death tax might be um, instituted? Well, death tax really isn't death tax. It calls an estate tax. And if you're sure. smart or you actually work with somebody who's smart, you don't pay any estate taxes. We but had the people going to probate. Is, the people what? going to probate. Is there is there additional funds on top of that 30% or is that included? Is that part of that fund? You would think it would be, wouldn't you? No, they're allowed to charge attorney's hours on top of the commissions. I mean, it's their world. You're playing in their world because you're the one that signed up to be in it. As a, as opposed to, why don't you set up a revocable living trust, put the assets in the trust, provided you're competent. Okay. Yeah. Don't put anything in the trust, though, that is qualified. Don't put any retirement assets because it doesn't own, you don't own it yet because the taxes haven't been paid. Okay. So you put your cars. I put my cars in the trust. And now you wind up with a new Z- a sound X number. It would begin with the letter Z. Okay. When something happens and it will eventually, I'm not going to live forever. People say, well, you know, if I, ever, when I, if I die, I said, that's a very interesting comment you make there. Cause I never met anybody live forever. <laughs> if I die, come on guys, let's get, keep it real here. <laughs> I was a little bit lighter. I'm a little upset right now because the seniors out there are being ripped off and we're going to be talking about something that, uh, so but before we go there, before we go there, one other thing I just see in the comments here from a lot of people, guys, look, um, the most important thing is to have silver, okay? If you don't have any and all you have is the fiat paper currency, there's going to be a day that I believe is going to be very sad for those people. Um, why don't we talk about the reason why you want silver instead of gold? Can we do that? Let, let's do that real quick. I think that's important because um, I started off as a gold bug and I actually happened to have a much higher percentage in my in gold. So I've been very interested in what you've been saying. And the reason I kind of started off that way is I was looking at it from a in, inflation hedge and wealth insurance for me based on my current situation. Um, and so this year, my goal is to start going more into silver because I I probably am too heavy into the gold and I've started listening to you. So I, I'd love to have you share that with everybody because it's something sure. that I hadn't really thought that it could get to that point potentially. I've heard that maybe it could and it maybe was in the past, but I'd love to have you expound on that a little bit for us. Well, let me give a little bit more background here, okay? So uh, after I sold the practice and the guy died that had all the silver and the guy told me, so uh, let me let me get this straight. I'm going to give you uh, the piece of paper with ink on it. You're going to give me all the silver. And that's when I realized things aren't quite right. So I uh, went back to James Madison, found out whether or not any of my transfer, my credits would transfer and whether or not I could apply even to get into the MIT Austrian Monetary Economics course got, taught by Dr. Antel Fichette. And uh, by the struck of God, I got into the course. There was 25 of us. Okay. And it, 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 was, it was completely eye-opening. There's a big difference between Austrian Monetary Economics and Keynesian Economics, which is what we're currently underneath of right now, which is why on the other shows that I've been doing, I'm saying, look, What's going on right now is you have the Goliath of Keynesian economics fighting the Goliath of uh, Austrian monetary economics, and they're upstream from you. 
and they are, there is, there's foaming water. There's all kinds of activity. The sides of the, of the banks are going up like this. It's the, it's the most epic battle. It's a biblical battle that's going on right now. True. It's a metaphor that I'm using. Okay. But what's happening is you're seeing the systematic destruction and removal and bankruptcy of the bank for international settlements. Now they have their tentacles and everything and everybody. If you control the money of a country, you can control exactly what that country does. So let's suppose that I want Jared to do something naughty. Okay. I could say Jared and Jared doesn't want to do it. I said, okay, Jared. I said, but you love your children, right? You're either going to do this. See, this is evil to the nth degree. And this is what I stared in the eyes of yesterday. Whew, man, belly of the beast. I got to tell you, uh, he does not want, didn't want his picture taken. He got out. Okay. But some of the things that he had to do were absolutely too disgusting for me to talk about, even on this platform. Yeah, and no, I've, I, I've heard things. I've heard things. Yeah, it's not good. Well, so at any rate, we, we, we talked about the bars. The bars are not fungible. They're not money. They're problematic because the uh, person you're going to sell them to doesn't know they're real. They don't know whether or not they're hot. Okay. But that same instance, they don't do that with, with uh, silver eagles. They don't do it with dimes. Okay. Dimes, I'm really hot on because there are you, your your people uh, writing down this, taking some notes on this. There are 14 are you, if dimes. You're, if you're taking a note on all this stuff and you're enjoying it, hit a one uh, in the chat there so we can see how many of you guys are enjoying this. Because I know if you're not, you better lie. A lot of people in here. <laughs> that thumbs up as well. By the way, Ted, we just got you over 600 subscribers, so we've just oh. passed that that mark for you. We're putting your oh. link in our chat here. Then I'll continue. Thank you very much. That's very kind of y'all. I appreciate it. He's okay. he's he's subscriber um uh operated. It's kind of like a sales guy with coins. <laughs> so. uh-huh. Yeah. So uh so bring us a full circle now. Uh Let's what do, do we want to try to wrap up or go into next? So I, I think I think we should so I think we hit that pretty good. You know, one thing I'm just throwing out to people having metals is better than not having metals. Cool. Um Having metals have that more. Have, yeah, having metals that have denominations in that country. Have <laughs> I see what's going to happen. I'm not it, wrong. I'm 65. I started certain soul free out, businesses. Right? I'm not wrong, folks. Listen to Jarrett. Listen to me. Listen to Andy Sheckman. Listen to Ron. I mean, th- we know what's going on. We're the honest yep. guys out there. Okay. You take a look at who I am. Here I am. Okay. Yep. All right. You take a look at who you're taking advice from. You ask them to share their credentials. It's called a CV. <laughs> totally. It's called a curriculum vitae. Ask to see the CV of whoever it is that wants to move your money around. Because chances are you have more money than they do. These people are advisors. They're not planners. It is a big distinction. See, when I was involved in this, it was a nice environment. We all played by the rules. And if you didn't, you got your hands slapped pretty hard. Oh, yeah. There's nobody out there slapping hands. And that's why we're going to talk about this. Okay, so let's do that. So one one quick intermission for everybody. You guys go check out um, Ted's uh, Ted's channel. Um, below we will have links to. It's, it's already set up there. We've got links to his website. Um, and then he's got. Some so don't click on that link unless you want to know the truth, and you want to know the truth as brutally and honesty as you possibly. Yeah, they got a mind blown, guys. Mind blown. And then mods, if you could also put in a link to um, Andy Sheckman's channel. Um, and also to Ron's Basements channel, because both of those guys are great guys. I I, I was supposed to have a call earlier with Andy today, and it, it kind of fell through. It's going to happen in a week. But um, Andy's Ron's, the man. Ron's I have been following too. Andy for about 10 years. Yep. He is the gentleman of gentlemen. But I got to tell you, we're all getting old. <laughs> I've gotten old. I don't look like I used to when I first started this. And what's touching is Andy's a very nice guy. And he's getting gray hair and, and Bill Holter is getting gray hair and uh, Dunnigan's getting gray hair and uh, you know, crap guys, this, this look, I'm going to get mad here now. Have you ever heard of something called a deferred prosecutorial agreement? Have you ever? I have not. No, I have no okay, idea. What let, that is. let me tell you what happened. You heard about how JP Morgan had to pay a fine of like $935 million for bringing the silver market, right? Oh yeah. yeah. You hear about that? Uh, maybe twice too, I think. Well, I'm going to tell you a third time. Okay. Third, okay. <laughs> All right. So they paid the fine and, and the verdict was guilty. Okay. However, they got what's called a deferred prosecutorial agreement. Okay. Which means that we know you're guilty. You know you're guilty, but don't do it again for two years. Guess what they did as soon as they left the meeting? 
they went back out and started rigging the silver market. And you know that's true because we're seeing a 393 paper units of silver to one ounce of gold. I'm one ounce paper units of silver every one ounce of physical silver that exists. Where are the regulators? Look, folks, I'm going to ask you to vote for me for mayor. It turns out that there's a, a justice program uh, out there that I looked into because when I started getting these notes and the 88 year old couple having their money taken away from them, I started doing some research in ways that I could help you guys. And we did our first uh, podcast uh, last Friday. So that's where we are right now. So this is a program. It's called the community for oriented policing service, policing services, policing services. Okay. So what I'd like you to do, is I'd like to see whether or not you would allow me to vote as your representative and allow me to take on this community-oriented group that we have here, okay? And let me get in there and let me, if you elect me as mayor, you better duck because I'm going to shoot them all <laughs> out of there. If you're doing anything wrong and you're ripping off the seniors of America, you better you better get the hell out because I'm Ted's coming, coming for you. If you vote for me, okay, to be mayor, underneath of this hide under a rock because I have a slew of people and we're coming after the people that are lying. I know who's telling the truth. Now, isn't it sad that we can't say who the bad guys and good guys are even with documentation. Anyway, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Well, but, but real quick, Ted on this. Um, yeah. You, you were telling me earlier, because by the way, guys, we've only been in communication since 10 o'clock. Um, my time last night. Um, this Time is all brand new. Me. We're just figuring this out as we go here, and I'm getting a lot of information pretty fast. But um, I think you had told me that you received a lot of emails from people that have gone under this this situation. And I, you know, for example, I don't have any gray hairs yet, but I'm in my late 40s. I just happen to have darker hair that doesn't go gray for some reason. But and it's not dyed. It's not dyed, guys. But um, you know, I bet there's people listening and watching right now, and will watch this and replay that either are at the age where they could be, let's say, or they know someone or have a relative that that could happen to. And, you know, it, it can be very scary, guys, because this is this is your nest. This is nest eggs. This is wealth. This is where they're counting on being able to support themselves and potentially pass. Yeah, money is the number one cause of the uh, breakups and divorce and, and oh, uh, money, family totally. violence and all that. But isn't it funny? We're not even talking about money. What we're talking about is... Uh, digital fiat currency, aren't we? <laughs> it's so it's, it's all made the, up. Well, here's the thing that someone has done a great propaganda campaign to call the, the fiat dollars, these things money. This is what people call money. They dad, That's I need right. some money. Yeah. And I give them a silver coin and my kids are like, I don't know what to do with the silver coin at the store. Yeah. I need We'd this. Like stuff. To have one of these. Yeah, there you go. A 10. You think when they first came out with the one, uh, one Zimbabwe dollar that they ever thought that it would have to print a 10 trillion dollar uh, Zimbabwe dollar? I got how, how many, how many of you guys want 10 trillion dollars, right? Goodness. How, well, why not make it a quadrillion? Why not stop at 10, 10 trillion? Folks, it doesn't work that way when it taught when it. Okay. They're beautiful. I love them. You love them. It'll be here after we're dead. My grandmother got, remember these old blue books that you would get and they had little holes punched in them and you would put the dime from 1913 yep. with an S mark on it or something like that. That's who my grandmother taught us about money a long time ago. Belva Rodkey was her name. God rest her soul. She bought my first case of beer when I was 16. I thought that was hot dog stuff. <laughs> Full case of beers. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> so what's worth more, the fiat money that bought the case of beer or the case of beer? To me, it was a case of beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Depends upon what you want. But, yeah. uh, you know, what's happening here, folks, is all fiat currencies have a life cycle. We are way beyond the life cycle of the U.S. dollar. OK. And what's propping it up right now and what's going on is something called a crack up boom. All right. A crack up boom. All right. That does not sound good, guys. That sounds bad. This is where we are. OK. Can you uh, can you provide this to our friends out there? Sure. Okay. Yep. This is what's called a crack up boom. When credit expansion leads to hyperinflation and people abandon the monetary system as a result. If a crack up boom occurs, people seek alternative currency to hold value because they don't want the paper money with rapidly declining value. Hold it now. This is not written correctly, is it? Do you see a problem here with what they've written? They seek the alternative money. currency. Why don't yep, you just currency. simply go back to the money? 
You know why they don't want you to go back to the money? Because the money gets you outside the system. The money makes you in control. So Margaret Ann and I, we were in uh, Italy uh, for one of the ING trips. And I took some cash over there. And we found these really nice ceramic masks. And we thought, well, we'll bring some masks back for and give them as gifts for our family and that kind of thing. So we picked out about 10 of them in a little store and went to pay for them. I had the almighty dollar with me, right? And this, I think, was in 2004, 2005. So I lay out all these hundred dollar bills to pay for these masks. He says, oh, we don't take that here. Well, the last time I was in in, uh, in Italy, I mean, it was probably when I was 13 or 14 years old. And the dollar is king dog. I mean, they wanted the dollar. The lady said, I'm sorry, we don't take that. You'll have to go to the bank and get euros. That's what's going to happen to you if you're holding bars. I'm sorry, we're not going to take the bar. You got to go get the money in order mm -hmm. to go get the currency. OK, same thing. And let's suppose you go to try to get rid of that bar. In the meantime, somebody else like me comes in there and they buy all the mass. You're out. Folks, you want the maximum amount of, of value. OK, purchasing power. But don't be penny wise and pound foolish. I'm not trying to spend your money. Come on. What we're trying to do is we want the money of the coin of the realm, okay, in the country in which you live. So, like I said, there, I'm getting calls from even Australia. Somebody somebody reached out to us from Australia. Hmm. You need to hold the money of your country, and there is money of your country, but not the currency of the country. The money, do we know the difference? Why don't you tell them the difference between the money and the currency? Uh, money has real value to it. It actually has in my opinion, money has two things. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that it goes by, but to me, it has a value outside of it, it the thing itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with gold and silver is real money and you can use it for jewelry. You can use it for industry. There's some real value to it. It has, mm -hmm. it has a purpose outside of just being used for monetary, which is one of the problems I have with crypto. Um, in so general, we'll now, crypto just for a second. Sure. Yep. Is there a unique identifier with a crypto unit? So let's suppose you tell me how many bit how many Bitcoin are there? Uh, te te technically, um, yeah, that, that gets a little. Technically, there's not. There's just a a ledger that keeps track of. And who keeps the ledger? You yeah, trust yeah. them. With a Bitcoin of sixty eight thousand or sixty two thousand dollars, you must really trust them. <laughs> but more it's importantly, let's suppose <laughs> let's suppose there was a million Bitcoin out there. This is the arguments I'm giving to me. Oh, you yeah. got to buy Bitcoin. All right, fine, I'll buy Bitcoin. Which Bitcoin do I own? Which one? If it's between one and a million, that's a finite number. Which one in between do I own? I want a certificate saying Ted. Yeah, you, you don't you don't get that. It's you get it, you get a little mark on a on a ledger that's on a like a thousand computers. No, I want to know which one of the million bitcoins I own. No, you and can't have that. Then I'm not gonna buy it. Go bark at somebody else. It's not going to happen with me because you can't give me, you can't tell me that yeah. my finite labor is being exchanged for something that's finite. And you're not going to be honest with me and tell me what the Bitcoin number is <laughs> when you're going to go out there and goad me into believing that you're only creating a million of these things or whatever. Come on, guys. Look, all this was created, I think, as a way to bleed off the pressure from money, real uh, from receipts for a dollar for money going into money. And going into cryptocurrency. Isn't it funny they call it Bitcoin? Bit has a sort of a computer denomination to it. Coin. And it's also looks like it looks like a gold coin whenever you no, see it. No, only because the art of it. Oh, I can make it real pretty. I mean, yeah. I like purple. I mean, why don't we make it purple? <laughs> why do you make it gold? Okay. Why don't can we make it purple? How about yeah. blue? I like blue. I I really like cobalt blue. Yeah. The water down there in in uh, Bora Bora is is what's called cobalt blue. And I was I was scuba diving, standing sixty two feet down on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. There were a bunch of lemon sharks. I was in a t shirt and pair of shorts and two tanks. Okay, and the water temperature is eighty four degrees. Oh, that's goodness, called cobalt that's, blue. I have not been able to dive that warm yet. I'm hoping to. But to just answer a question that came up on here too, guys, with Bitcoin, look, um. I have no doubt that people will continue to pile money into Bitcoin. You may see the price continue to go up. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about the difference of what's what's money. And to me, money has a tangible asset. It has to be physical. It can't be digital. And it has to be something that you can use in, uh, for another purpose. That's, that's, to me, what money means. Now, will people trade in Bitcoin? Will they use it? Will people transact back and forth with it? Right now, they are. So I'm not many. I'm not. Well, they will until they don't. The problem I have with cryptos, though, is it it requires electricity. Okay, mm -hmm. so what happens if you don't have electricity? It's worthless. Oh, yeah. um, 
Didn't know that. You also have the ability for things to be tracked. It is not anonymous. Yes, you can buy it and put it into an anonymous wallet. It's not exactly anonymous. They can trace where it came from, where it Trust goes. me. Trust us. George Orwell says, trust us. Yeah, the 1984. Yeah. Folks, again, trust the periodic table and trust your God. Nothing else. When the yep. war is over and all this and you're holding the real money, the new currency will come out. I've seen the new currency. Yes, I have. Uh, the lady that's going to be heading this up, watch her. Her name is Dr. Judy Shelton. Have you ever heard the name before? She uh, is no. Sharp. No. Oh, she's Folks, write this down. Her name is Dr. Judy Shelton, and she's going to be the new president of the Treasury, director of the Treasury. She's very smart. She's on was on President Trump's working group for, for um, and she was on she was put on the board by Trump uh, on the Federal Reserve Board. And I was told that um, that she's not going to be posting much, okay, until the very end, and, meaning that this whole the whole reset has happened. And what's happening now is she's posting almost every day, and sometimes two and three times a day. Again, I was told. She's not going to post very much until we get close to the end. And when you get close to the end, they're going to start, you know, uh, start posting more. She's going to put more stuff out there. And everything that she's putting out there is relating to returning back to the gold standard. But see, folks, you're never going to get a second chance at this. Your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren will have never had this opportunity from you. Think about this for a minute. You're at the right place at the right time. You have resources. What you need to do now is take the knowledge that you have and put action behind it because knowledge without action is worthless. You're yep. just a pontificator. You're out there just bloviating and stuff. Put the knowledge that you have to work for you. Now, I know you, you, you don't know who to trust. And somebody said buy crypto or buy bars and put them in vaults. Well, there's an old saying by Mark Twain. It goes like this. It's easier to fool a man than to teach him that he's been fooled. So I have an uphill battle here. So I'm already getting hit, hit by the sharks. If you want me to be your mayor and represent you in this uh, program that's out there offered by the um, Department of Justice, and you feel as though you've been injusted, okay, what I'd like you to do is send me a note or a letter um, telling me basically what the situation was, how much you lost your age, and how much money was left over, and who you dealt with, and what the terms of the contract are. Now, please redact um, any account information. I need to know who you are, though, okay, if you're comfortable with that. But this is what I hope to do. So I'm going to be getting all this information in. I have over 100 emails right now that I'm starting to get, go through, okay? And I've already talked to a law firm. They said, Ted, you get the information together. We'll take a look at it. So they take a look at it, and they decide to take the case on, okay? And we prevail. I'm planning on filing RICO charges. Because these guys are going after you guys in mass, okay? And a RICO charge, if we prevail, provides for treble damages, which means that whatever you lost gets multiplied by three. So if you're smart, what I would do is get your own money in your own possession as soon as possible. If you have money that's in a vault, find out how much of a check they would send you, get the check, calculate the difference, and that's the amount of your lawsuit. OK, and then what we'll do is put the, all the lawsuits together, put a law, put it with a law firm that has experience with this and get all your money back times three. That's the way you're going to get out of this. And so, we're going to put these charlatans that are claiming they have false knowledge. Fa they're claiming they have knowledge, but actually it's false knowledge because the guy that's doing this doesn't have any, any kind of training, formal training in economics, finance. Uh, does he know what a sharp ratio is? Don't know alpha, alpha is. I mean, do you know what the hypothecation is? I probably knows that. Okay, that's pretty easy stuff. But, um, you know, then you got these other guys that are coming out with something called a milkshake theory. Oh, Lord, I thought I was stupid. I never heard of milkshake theory before. Actually, <laughs> it's invented. It's a part of a subset of the crack up boom. If you read through it, take a look at the milkshake theory, okay, and take and read it and take a look at the crack up boom and read it. Okay. Yeah. They, while you're they, at it, I think they're missing the. I think they're missing the boat on that. I just. I don't. I don't see why any country that decides to return to sound money doesn't base it on gold and silver. I don't understand why anybody would bring in other metals, bring in other commodities. Um, because they can. Commodities. Because they can. They. They put. It, it's not good. It's not a good idea. It's bad. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
do we have time to talk about fractional reserve banking and how the things actually work as far as your money in the bank is concerned? Yes. So I, I think we got sidetracked a little while ago. I don't know if we totally hit, I do want to hit that. And it's a big, huge point I make on my channel too, but I don't think we totally went over the part of silver talking about gold versus silver and the ratio. Oh, okay. Let's, okay. Can we go to, um, let's see, pull up, um, pull like SD bullion, someplace that has a current sure. spot price for gold and silver. Okay. And what we're probably going to find out is that the current spot price is going to be probably around maybe 2470 for the silver and maybe what say 2200 for the gold okay can we go with those numbers we close yeah we're gonna well we're gonna pull it up so you guys can see it real quick okay there so what go. we're gonna do is we're going to calculate the paper ratio how many paper ounces of silver does it take to buy a paper ounce of gold are you with me yep so we're gonna take the 2170 2170 and we're gonna divide that by 2450. Yep. So that means that we get, get 88.57 ounces of silver for every one ounce of gold. Okay. Now you're not going to get 88. You go to the coin store. They're going to take something off called a VIG. All right. I got out at 120 paper and I netted 107. Wow. And I don't want to tell you how many ounces of gold I had. It was a fair amount, but I knew that was the top of the market. So how did I know that? Folks, what I'm telling you is true. I'm in a master's level program. We're all still friends. And uh, we got a guy in Vietnam and all other people around the world. Uh, there's about 20 of us. And we talk and we know what's going on. And we don't know the timing, but we do know what is going to happen. So unless your financial advisor can tell you they have an uh, inside link like what we do, somebody inside the Federal Reserve Bank, somebody inside the Treasury, we do. I'm not going to take any risks. I'm not going to go back and remake the dollars that I already made. Besides, I have inheritance that I haven't touched either. I'm not going to lose that either. But I know that what I'm holding, I'm very comfortable with, and you need to feel the same way. But I can tell you from the letters that I'm receiving here and emails, there's a lot of trepidation. There's a lot of pain here. I mean, you don't know what's going on. You're worried. You're concerned. There's sort of like an inner thing going on inside your body or your head saying, Ah, it's like running your fingers across this chalkboard. You know, something ain't quite right, but you can't quite put your finger on it. Well, that's because you're looking too far downstream of where the problem is. The problem is upstream of you between the Goliath of Keynesian economics having a battle with the Goliath of Austrian monetary economics. And they're going like this. And all this water around is going like this. And it's causing problems down here. Oh, the housing market's blowing up. Oh, my gosh, the interest rate. Oh, the bond market. What's happening? We can't see that far upstream. I'm upstream. I'm telling you what the problem is. It's a it's a global problem. It's a global change that's happening right now. It's biblical. We're seeing the removal of the Bank for International Settlements globally. But immediately as that happens, as soon as those fake funds are pulled out, it's going to create a vacuum and the real money's got to go back in. And that is what's called the reset. Like when a uh, the mon uh, when the mon uh, Monopoly game is over, okay? And the, the one guy has all the properties and all the money. Money? What does he have? Money? What is that? No, paper notes. It's, okay? it's about the it same is. stuff. <laughs> you roll the dice, and, and no matter where you land on the board, you're broke. <laughs> so yeah, what's, totally. what do you do then? How many people are broke in the United States? Most. How is the United States broke? you daggone right they are. $20 trillion in a checking account with $655 trillion against it? Yeah, of course, you better yeah. get yours while you can. There isn't that much left. Uh, I don't know what else to say. What what kind of comments? What are people? Is this message resonating with people? Or are we on the wrong platform? No, they're good. They're they're having a lot of fun. Um, we have. I'm going to show you a couple comments. <laughs> good. In here. I, I can't um, see if I could see the comments. I'd be reading them instead of talking to you guys. I don't know what's going on. But if it's hit, if 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 what I'm saying is resonating, with you, can you see this comment? If the same ratio is traded, but that ratio is way off to what manipulation transferring into that is what you feel is, do you feel the best is for your family? Preparation is the key. Preparation is the, the key. I always do what's best for my family. But the paper ratio does not relate to the mining ratio. Are you people taking notes? I mean, uh, this is I'm teaching basically <laughs> a, a college notes. level economics. We're getting a master class here today. Yeah. Where have you ever heard this stuff before? I doubt it. We ever hear it again? I doubt it. Okay. So the m current mining ratio is seven to one. It used to be 12 to one, but they said it was 16 to one. You know why they bumped up the 16 to one? 
because it took more energy to get the the more mass out of the out of the mine. Okay. Yeah. So there was more more effort per pound to get the silver out. So they said, well, we're not going to go with 12 to 1. That's a real mining rate. We'll go 16 to 1. Okay. <laughs> it's it's so, so much crap. Okay. I love it. And then, so, uh, so now where question. we are, we're 7 to 1. But of the seven units that come out of the ground of yeah. silver relative to the one, out, uh, one unit that comes out of the ground of gold, okay, 60% of that is grabbed right off the market, right off the bat by industry to consume it. That, I'm not talking about money for metal, okay? So the inverse of 60%. Yeah, it's, it's going into metal. like my iPad and stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sure, there's Lord silver panels. in that. Right. Yep. So you take the inverse of the 60%, which is 40%. Take the 40% against the 7 to 1. You get your 2 to 8.1, right? So 2.8 units of silver to every one unit of gold, okay, is what can actually be used for money. So then let's round it up to 3, and let's say we're at 2,100 for gold. 3 into 2,100 is what? 700 bucks, right? Isn't that where we should be? But more importantly, if you bought the daggone Eagles, the which is money, that. and you took the Eagles back into your coin store, and you exchanged the coin, the uh, the American Silver Eagle, for say five thousand dollars, is that a taxable event? No. You know why? If you took the same Eagle into the bank and it was worth five thousand dollars, and they gave you five thousand dollars back, is that a taxable event? If you take a hundred dollar bill in and you get a uh, hundred, you know, whatever number of quarters it would be, is that a taxable event? Is that a reportable event? No, I had the tax codes. I'm telling you, American Silver Eagles and junk up the 1000 face are not reportable. Ask Andy and a Sheckman. He knows. That. Ask Bill Holter. Ask anybody that runs a coin factory, not a coin factory, but a, um, a you know, coin store. So y you need to have the facts. A couple other things we talked about is that the uh, it takes 14 dimes to make one ounce of silver. Keep that in mind. It's a good ratio to remember. So when you start pricing how much junk silver is, are you paying the right amount? So it doesn't matter how you get up to $1.40, $1.40 in any denomination of pre-65 coins, okay, as far as their silver content is concerned, is still going to give you one ounce of silver. Isn't that yep. interesting? Isn't that interesting? So $1.40... So three fifty cent pieces will put you a little bit over an ounce of pure silver. Okay, isn't it also interesting that silver is measured in troy ounces, whereas everything else is measured in the United States called avonpois ounces. You know, look at that; it came from France. So avonpois is actually a measure of a pile. Okay, and I'm talking about a measure of silver. Um, excuse me, wool. It was wool. But you'll also find that most of the coins here, most of the coins and and uh, currency and money units around the world. They have an etymological root, meaning that where the the name for that actually came from was Latin. What well, was a uh, Romance Latin? Okay, so like for instance, let's take the word college. The word yep. college is made up of two different words. Cole means to gather, and lege means to read. So the real definition of a college is a place to gather and read, right? So then you got a university. A university, uni means one, right? United States, uni, UTED, UTED, whatever. Okay, so. Um, you have one place for many. Versity is many, okay? So a university is one school for many, many schools inside the university. Does that sound right? Is that the way yep, it works? Yep. yep it yep. is when I went to school there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, it is because like every, I, 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 I've got three degrees. Um, well, I got an associate's first, then I got a bachelor's, then I got a master's. And mm -hmm. um, I went to a specific school at the university. And that's, you know, that's the school I went to. So that's my alumni associations through that school, as well as the university. Mm -hmm. Do you have that list of uh, currency note uh, names of money that all that reverts back to uh, to silver? So the name shekel, mm -hmm. shekel means silver, drachma means silver. OK, uh, the dollar was not called the dollar. The dollar was actually called Thaler, T-H-A-L-E-R. Look it up. And it came from Germany. And guess what the word Thaler means? I'll give you one guess there, Jared. Silver. 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 <laughs> Silver. Yep. So can you blow me up? Can, and um, Yeah, we can. You, know, you guys, you can take a screenshot of this, right? And you can use that to verify this. There was someone that called yeah, in. I think correct. they were from Norway. And they they challenged this. They said, I don't believe this. So they looked up the name of their currency, and they did uh, an entomological search on it. And guess what the name of their currency came back to mean? Silver. It wasn't Bitcoin. It's not on this planet. <laughs> no, I'm just messing tell, with the crypto guys that are yeah, in here watching this. There's an old saying. Actually, the net Zang came out with this, and I added two more words to it. 
Yeah. If you don't hold it, you don't own it, right? I, it's a it's a beautiful saying. If you don't own it, we do. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if you what? don't hold it, you don't own it, we do. Because we have the real money. You have the fake stuff. When the fake stuff melts down, do your, do your, does your crowd know anything about Exeter's Pyramid? Um, I don't know if they do. I've seen it on, you showed it on Ron's, which would be, I, I let's see if I can pull it up. Are, are, are people getting burned out? I mean, this is, we're covering a lot of information here. Uh, no, they're still hanging in. So we've got a couple more things we're going to hit guys here um, that I think will be good. But how do I, how do I look that up? How do I spell the pyramid? Oh, I'm sorry. John Exter is a guy. E-X-T-E-R, E-X-Exter's Pyramid. E-X-T-E-R, Pyramid. Extra's I, I got it. John Exter. So we're going to put this up for you guys. Just a second here. John Exter was a Federal Reserve Board member, and he was actually the creator of one of these small, smaller countries' central banks. Hmm? Okay, so John Exter's pyramid is an inverted pyramid like this, and at the very tip of the pyramid is silver. Up from that is gold, and up from that are all the proxies against the, against the money. Okay? Now, it's upside down because there are many more claims against the dollar Okay. Uh, they're very. Oh, you found one with truth, folks. We owe Jared a round of applause because of all the types of uh, charts he could have pulled up. Most of them didn't have silver at the point. He pulled it out. So look how much silver there is to be used for money compared to gold. That's a fraction. Price, yes. Why are the prices that way? Could it be that we've been lied to on epic scale? Could it be that silver is much more rare than gold? Is it possible? Anything's possible. So we're looking at base money, bank money, all these other derivatives. Some a derivative is something derives its value from something else. Okay. Now a synthetic derivative is a bet on a bet. So let me explain a derivative to you here. Okay. You and I are going to go into and we're going to have a a blackjack game. Okay. Yeah. You're going to bet hundred bucks. I'm going to bet hundred bucks. Bottom line is a hundred dollars is being bet. Remember that only a hundred dollars. Okay. Now, Jared has a whole lot of friends that think that Jared's going to win, and I have a whole lot of friends that think I'm going to win. So my friends decide to bet Jared's friends that Jared's going to they, – they think that Jared's going to lose. Jared's friends think that, I, that uh, Jared's going to win. So they bet off track, okay? They bet off track like betting, okay? And they now have created a derivative of the bet that, they, that uh, Jared and I made. And because there's so many of them, they bet $100,000, okay? Against the bet for how much? A hundred dollars. Yep. Now that is a derivative. Okay. Do you think these guys go stop at a derivative? No, they're greedy. You, you really don't own a thing that you think you do. So now there's another layer of derivatives above that called a synthetic derivative. And that's the snowball that we talked about the other day on Ron's channel. Right here, guys, up here. It's not even there, right? Yeah. Wow. Actually, why don't we consider the snowball all the white that's around it? <laughs> <laughs> it's that go. bad. It's that bad, okay? There's quadrillions of dollars of derivatives out there. And if you look at the Dodd-Frank rule that was passed in 2010, derivative holders have a superior lien holder on your lien on your account through fractional reserve banking. Okay, check it out. I have the reports. Folks, send me a text or what, an email or something. Do they have the email address up there? Uh, we've got, we've okay. got your email in in the um, in the description, everybody. Okay. If they if they want it from you, I'll send it. I can put it in here. Give it me. It doesn't second. really matter where you get it. You need to get it. Okay. I don't care where you get it from. You can put uh, Jared to work and put my office to work. Whatever. But the bottom line is, you got to get this stuff. Okay. So what I'm saying is, all these other things have no intrinsic value whatsoever. The derivatives, non-money commodities, corporate and municipal bonds, government bonds, bank money, base money. All of this are claims against the finite, constitutionally defined money source in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, which defines what money is. All this stuff is going to melt down. As it all melts down, and I'm not making this up, it happens throughout history. History repeats, okay? And so all this is going to melt down, and that value, which is never simply vaporizes, that value is going to go down into the gold and the silver. You see what I'm talking about? Yep. So, you know, this is why I'd like to have that whiteboard. I think like 1500 bucks or whatever. We got to get up. <laughs> I'm not, we're, we're putting this thing together on a shoestring. Nick is handling all the, uh, the, the marketing. He's got us a website and all this kind of stuff up and running and since last Friday. Cause we didn't know whether or not you got your uh, audience was going to be into this. Turns out they're pretty smart. 
there were what 25,000 views on the first one we did, my first podcast we ever did. And then the 23 or 24,000 on the second one, hundreds and hundreds of likes. Um, yeah. and, well, actually, no, thousands, I think. And then I don't know, whatever. And then you got all these emails. Folks, if you want to participate in the class action suit I'm putting together, you got to tell me whether or not you've had a problem and you feel as though you've been uh, mishandled. Okay. Like Aaron Brockovich put something together as far as the lawsuit against the people that were poisoning the water. They've been poisoning your money and they've been stealing it from you. And I'll represent you if you want me to in a, uh, in a class-wide suit. But the first thing you need to do is you have to make me the sheriff. Okay. So if there's interest, I'll pursue it, but you guys need to tell me whether or not you want me to do this. And you're going to so, tell Ted, me. You want Ted, me to we do don't, I don't have your email down below. What is your email again, real quick for everybody? First name, Ted at tedspeaks.com. Not net. I'm sorry. Ted at tedspeaks.net. Can you see this? Let's see. Are we close? There we yeah. Go. Oh, let me blow it up for you real quick. But I, I just put it in the chat too. Okay. And that's the website. So you guys, there's the contact information. There you go. And we've got links that are throughout the chat. We've got links down below. I just don't have his email. So we'll throw that down there. I have lived my life according to a poem that Robert Frost uh, wrote many years ago. It's called The Road Less Traveled. And um, basically the, st the story is this. I traveled down a well-worn uh, road. Everything was going fine. And I came across a, 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 a divide in the woods. One path was well-trodden and the other path was overgrown. I chose the path less, less traveled and that's made all the difference in the world. The path that I'm on right, on right now is filled with sticker bushes and, and uh, sharks and all kinds of stuff. And I'm in retirement. I retired 15 years, 14 years ago. I was done in 2010, sold national computer ribbons. And then I got mad because I saw the way that people's estate plans were being done. And I started the Prevenza group. We did thousands and thousands of revocable living trusts. And I was on the radio for 15, 16 years. We, we were the force to be reckoned with. And I was flown around the country by ING uh, to help train their other reps that I had that, that they wanted to try to help uh, meet help. I, I did it. I mean, just because it was the right thing to do. But um, uh, there's a lot of breath here. We'll start talking about estate planning after the reset, how to take care and keep your assets under your control. But it ain't going to happen with the will. See, most people, they want 100 percent of their assets to go where they want it to go. If, if your assets have to go through the probate process, which is simply changing title to the assets after you're dead and gone, then the attorneys in the courts are going to jack and grab a chunk of that. And you don't know what that chunk is going to be. Besides, do you want the attorneys in the courts getting involved in your personal money? Why not have a child take care of it as a successor trustee? And why not have another child make your advanced health care directives in terms of uh, end stage conditions? So I really don't want to get into too much estate planning here. I want to keep this on the money because you know why? Because you have to learn about the things that are actionable first. There's yes. a lot of stuff you don't know, but learn the stuff that's actionable and then put it to put it to work. Knowledge without action is completely worthless, isn't it? So you guys are big it people. Is. You're at a point in time in your life that if you, pre if you prepare properly, you'll be fine. So, Ted, I think the last thing for us to hit here is fractional reserve lending. Um, I have been re-listening to the um, Creature from Jekyll Island. Over there on fractional reserve lending off the table. And the Creature from Jekyll Island is a great book, you guys, or go grab it on audiobook. Um, it's it's kind of a long one, so you might want to do it on audiobook. But fractional reserve lending is something that I don't believe comes from God. I believe it's something that comes from the other side. And uh -huh. it is something that I believe is set up to basically enslave and put people into bondage. Exactly. Exactly. Because when you put the money that's in the bank, when you put your money in the bank, okay, it's, let me read this to you. Okay. When you put your money in the bank, okay, uh, you are issued then a, um, um, a, what's called a bailment. Okay. Look, look here. In most legal systems, can you see this? Okay. Yes. In most legal systems, a bank deposit is not a bailment. In other words, the funds deposited are no longer the property of the customer. Can you see this? Yeah, put it a little closer for us. Right, well, there. everything's there backwards here, but anyway, uh, leave it there for a second. There you go, guys. Uh, Take a screenshot. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Now this comes off of Investopedia, and it's right there. If you take turn the time to read it, okay. So the funds become the property of the bank, all right? 
the customer receives in, in turn an asset called a deposit account. All right. So what happens is each bank is legally authorized to issue credit up to a specified multiple of its reserves. Do you know what the multiple, you know what the reserve liquidity requirement was of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation's banking system during COVID? Zero, mm -hmm. which means that the banks could take in your deposits. They didn't have to reserve anything and they can lend out 100% of it. And what that means is 1% of the people come back to get their money. Guess what? It isn't there. Okay. And so, I actually know way too much about that because my family got, we our our family's bank that we, our, my family started and then basically got taken out in 2008. I remember the day where my dad called me up and said, if we don't get so many billions of dollars by the end of day Friday, it's done. It, it goes into receivership with the FDIC. And it was taken away, guys, and it was a savings and loan. They took all of them out. They didn't bail any of them out. And here's the trick that I just want to put another point out is they were all basically forced to get into subprime loans and they were forced to get into negative amortization loans because it's the only way they could make money. They weren't allowed to do the same rates the banks did. And so there is a whole trick to that. And I believe they did that to get that whole lending type of an institution out of the way. They What's did. happening right now to they regional did. banks? And then mm -hmm. what will happen to credit unions next? You want me to tell you? Yes. I know what's going to happen. Okay. Tell so us. in order to get a charter, okay, uh, to open up a bank, you have to decide where you want to operate. So you have to decide what where you want to operate your bank. If you're a small, mid-sized regional bank, you had to invest about 65% of your liquid reserves in the CRE or commercial real estate. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. It was very interesting. Because okay? we, we were having some issues there these days. Okay. So as the interest rates continued to go up, okay, the value of the bonds continued to go down. Okay. However, when the bonds were first taken out, like five, six, seven years ago, okay, the interest rates were going down. So as the interest rates go down, the value of the bonds go up. Let me explain that to you. If you take out a bond paying three and a half percent, or let's say, no, you take out a bond paying 5%, okay? And now the interest rates go down and now the prevailing interest rates, three and a half percent. I want to buy a bond, okay? Um, the best interest rate that I can get is three and a half percent, but you're holding one at 5%. Is your bond worth more than a new one? No. Yes, it is. Because the part, oh, mean, yeah. My, my old one, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. So as the interest rates go down, the, the value of the bonds goes up. Okay. Yep. So the interest rates are going down. So you're holding a bond at paying 5%. It goes down to three and a half percent. Okay. Your bond is worth more because the best right. I can, you're holding a 5% bond. The best I can do is three and a half. Yes. So you're going to require a premium on your bond. Okay. Because you happen to be lucky enough that you bought it at the right time and interest rates went down. Yep. Well, what's happening right now? You're holding a bond paying three and a half percent, right? And interest yep. rates are going up. As the interest rates go up, what happens to the value of the bonds? They go down, right? Okay. So now we have an issue. It, we have a really big problem. So the value of the bonds, okay, that are underpinned by the buildings, okay, <coughs> it, is going down. The value of the buildings are going down because the vacancy is going up. Yep. Okay. And uh, you want me to stop now? Okay. <laughs> I keep getting messages from my wife to stop talking to you guys right now. So I don't want to do that. So at any rate, so the, so what's going to happen here is that the, the people from COVID understand now you don't have to go to work. You can actually work from your home. Yep. Think of the money being saved. So when I opened the Provenza Group in Owings Mills, Maryland, I just wanted to rent the amount of office space that I needed to show the people that, you know, who I was. But I didn't want to be renting commercial space to do stupid work like communications and that kind of stuff. You know, we can do letters and that kind of stuff and office space. It's a lot less than $28 to $38 square foot. So at any rate, what happened was um, uh, we got it all together and we put it together and uh, we built it from zero up to 700 million in assets under management, sold it in 2010. And that's when the client died and found all the silver in his house took it back to Golden Eagle Coin where he bought it. And that's when the guy says, hey, what's going on here? You, you're turning all this in? You want a pa piece of paper with ink on it? And that's one of the things that uh, the guy talked about uh, that I had a meeting with yesterday. He said, um, you guys in America, you're so foolish. He said, you're really dumb. You're not looked at as being very smart by, by, the, uh, by, the, by the really wealthy people.
They have you guys chasing around and killing one another for currency they're creating on a keyboard that has no value whatsoever. And that's yeah. why I said to him, I said, so if you could create any currency on the face of the planet in any denomination, in any amount, how would you quantify your wealth? How, what do they view their wealth as being? And he couldn't answer that question at the time. So I did hear that uh, apparently he did ask the question. He does have an answer and he wants to get that together again. Okay. So, that's good. That's good news. <laughs> we'll see what me. happens. We'll see what happens. So what we've cover covered is fraction reserve banking. Okay. And this is all part of Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics says that you really don't have to worry about deficits. You can basically bar your way out of a deficit. Bar your and, way out and of debt. The current administration loves this concept and they love Keynesian economics. Yes, they do. Because of, because politicians like to promise things that they don't have to pay for. Yep. But you're paying for it very stealthily, okay, through inflation. The only reason we have inflation, the number one reason, bar none, get somebody on here. Wants to do, you want to debate me? <laughs> Let's have fun. I was, I was a master debater in college. I was on the Toastmasters International Group. And uh, so bottom line there is you have to be able to debate both sides of the issue. I'm not going to debate the other side. I can't go to the crypto side and try to debate myself. That's not going to happen. Why not a split personality or something crazy like that? I might die. <laughs> Don't want that to happen. <laughs> but, you know, here, here's the thing. I'll, I'll tell people that do have cryptos is, um, you guys, make sure you're diversifying. Um, someone brought up earlier, why do, why do all the online bullying dealers allow you to use crypto if it's so bad? And you can it's turn vogue. it in. It's Vogue. I mean, things come and go. I mean, no, look, at the Holland, also, look at the Holland Tulip Ball mania. You know what caused that to be over with? It was a soldier walking in an open air mart and he happened to pick up what he thought was an apple and took a bite out of it. And the guy that owned it was 120 euro or whatever the, mar the currency denomination was at the time. He absolutely freaked out. Oh, my God, you ate my my most prized bulb. And then what happened? People were, oh, gosh, this isn't money at all. And then the tulip bulbs got down to their most basic intrinsic value. Yeah. And who went, who went with all the money? Where'd the money go? See, money doesn't actually. It, it spiraled doesn't down. Either. It doesn't exist. It went back down to zero, basically. Well, not the real money. Not no, but the, money. the tulip money, whatever. You're, you know, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yes. Uh -huh. It's called the Holland Tulip Bulb Mania. And if you guys have not researched that, you have to go read that. If you're invested in crypto, go read that. If you have Sir a lot Winston, of U.S. dollars, go read that. Sir Winston Churchill is credited as having said, the further you look back in the history, the more clearly you can see the future. Okay. Now think about this for a minute. Think that you have a big window in front of you as you're going down the road. Okay. All right. So you can see what's ahead of you. And a little tiny window so you can see what's in back of you. Why is that? Why is that relationship the way it is? Because you got to know where you're going, but also keep an eye on where you've been. So the further you look back in history, the more clearly you'll be able to see the future. Yep. I'm not a soothsayer, folks. I mean, th historically, this is what's going to happen. I don't know the date and I don't know the time, but it could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. I mean, isn't, isn't uh, a knucklehead supposed to give his uh, State of the Union speech tonight? Well, I shouldn't be calling our president is he really a president <laughs> interesting hey folks if you go to the website okay um that we have set up i've hidden something there and let's see if you guys can find it see if you can find ends nothing can stop what is coming the acronym is on my website i know what's happening and for those of you that are really awake you know what's happening too have you, hear, have you ever heard the acronym nothing can stop what is coming it's on there and it's hidden you can see it. That's like a long time ago in the Playboy magazine. They used to hide the Playboy bunny uh, logo somewhere on the front cover. So I was told I never looked at that stuff. <laughs> you didn't either, did you? No. <laughs> I, I did uh, not. Now, did people have it all over the place on the school bus? Yes. Oh, I've heard. Oh, school, school bus. bus. Yeah. Okay. Horrible. Did they have school buses in college? In college, no. What school bus are you talking about then? Elementary, school. elementary school about it? crazy stuff kids yeah, <laughs> crazy stuff yeah. all right okay where are we with comments where are we with viewers i mean so, uh, how, how are things going folks is this message resonating with you i think um, it's resonating really well with a lot of people we've got a lot of great comments that are on here um they're calling me a liar now they think i totally have a staff somewhere <laughs> okay <laughs> what are there any are there any resonating questions that they would like to have answered that i haven't addressed 
Uh, let me. Okay, let's do that real quick, guys. Look, we've got, a couple we've got left. a big blunderbuss. You know what a blunderbuss yeah. is? It's a big gun. Yeah, you know, it's all kinds of crap. Gun, it has yeah. gunpowder. Goes out like that's what you got hit with today. <laughs> so okay, here's what we're gonna do: drinking from a fire hose, right? You guys have a minute here to. Um, I'm gonna give you two minutes to put your comments in here. We're gonna pick the five best comments. And I'm going to ask Ted to be a little quick on those ones, but we'll wind it down here. We've got 185 people watching live right now, 158 likes. If you guys haven't hit that like yet, please do that. That'll help get this the message. The other 23 don't like what we're saying? Yeah. No, it's <laughs> just they, they don't take the time to hit it. I don't know. You guys. Oh, that takes a lot of effort. Huh? More effort than what I'm doing. Come on. Thing. Come it on. Should be over, we should be over 200 uh, thumbs up right now. Oh, good. Okay. So what kind of so, questions do we have that they would like to have answered? Yeah, so you guys put your questions in here. They'll they'll come in. Okay, <laughs> this is one you probably don't have an answer to, but you can give us maybe some a season, or maybe you can give us some roadmap or some road signs to look for. I'll tell you this: it should have already happened. It should have yeah. already happened. We are on borrowed time right now, and um, you watch the ten-year yield. People think that the 30 years, what you should look for as far as the housing market is concerned, but that's yep. not true. You look at the 10 year because people only get their mortgages about 7.7 7 years. Okay. Yep. Now what we have going on right now is called a bond yield curve inversion, meaning that the further you go out, the lower the interest rates are. So if you borrow money for 30 years, it's less than borrowing it for 10 years or five years or three years or, or 90 days. Does that make any sense to you? Where is the logic in that? Okay. So again, what I said, in times of war, smart money moves the hard money. Take it to the bank. In times of war, are we at war right now, Jared? Uh, I, we've been at war for a while, guys. Yeah. yeah. In time, so we are at war, right? So we the are. old saying goes, in times of war, smart money. Are you smart? You got money? Uh, depends on who you ask. In, 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 okay. <laughs> moves the hard money. Okay. So the yeah. question here is, what is the biggest problem facing America? integrity right right now it's, it's integrity, integrity but i would also say it's 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 truth and facts we well, seem to have like integrity. two or three versions of everything that's out there and artificial intelligence is about to make it that much harder for us to know what's real how many people it's think it's so that integrity? you think i'm spot on with integrity people lie they cheat yes, they steal i think so and it puts more pressure so. on you because the cost of living keeps going up and um do we have a funny do we have a couple minutes to tell the, um, yeah, um, it's called the, uh, uh, protecting your financial future. I did it with Lee and Christy Phillips. You answered your book. Okay. There. One other quick question before we get there real fast. Cause I know you, you kind of alluded to some of this not, stuff. Not on type one monster Facebook. boxes. No, the actual coins, but the box, no, the no, no, it's actually in the coin. Yeah. And you'll know it has a, a, a type two, but a missing read. Okay. And a read is one of the ridges that's on the outside edge. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, let me. Do okay. that there. Yeah, you can see the hole there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Now that is yeah. not a missing ridge. That that's just because uh, I don't no, have. Keep any going. It was on the other side there. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, keep turning, 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 turning. Well, this is I a type know. one. It was on there. <laughs> this is a type one. Okay. That's a type one. Okay. Right. There's no so on type there two. A type two will have a missing read at this level at this point right here. Okay. Okay. At the six o'clock mark on the coin. So here's the coin. Six o'clock mark. Uh, right here. Now, the following uh, run that they have, which would have been 2022, they moved it from the six o'clock mark, basically to the seven o'clock mark, then the eight o'clock mark and went around. So that's basically the plan. So some people are saying that, that I don't believe this tracking chip stuff. Why don't you look into Honeywell? Ask, do a Google and find out if Honeywell had any tracking technology that they put in packages of cigarettes. They're gloating about this. They're gloating about how they have the technology so they know where every pack of cigarettes is. It's a YouTube video. Um, if you can't find it, hit me up. I'll find it again, and I'll put it up uh, probably on the website or something. We just got the website going. Have you guys taken a look at it yet? I, I, I have the poem up there, The Road Less Traveled, and right next to it is a very nice car, and it's heading down a, uh, uh, a long um, Lancaster County road. So anyway, to make low income people like myself feel better, what percentage of Americans own silver and how much should a person own to feel comfortable? Obviously, I'm trying to get as much as possible. Yeah, me too. I mean, how much is enough? A little bit more <laughs> for all of us. So, um, um, you know, low income, 
I, I think you probably have gifts in another area. Okay. Don't measure your worth by what your income is. Measure your worth by how much you got up here. Okay. And then measure your, your, who you are as a human is how much you give back to others. I think that if you give more back, you give more back, you get more. So I've done it just, just for fun. I go to a bridge or whatever, like the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and a couple of times I paid for the next two people in back of me. Imagine the, imagine the lift that they had that day. Oh, my God, I didn't have to pay $3 for a toll. <laughs> it's not the amount. It's a gesture, okay? Yeah. So I'm out here, and Jared's out here. I hit up Jared uh, his time. What was it, about uh, 3 o'clock in the morning? 4 o'clock in the morning. Yes, four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I reached out at 7 a.m. That's <laughs> your three-hour time zone. See, I, I I waited for him a little bit. I was up at one. I started pulling all my stuff together because so much is happening. I, I, it's very wow. hard to sleep. There are. Well, did you hear? Did you hear about the uh, the nuclear warnings that went off in Russia last night? No, that doesn't sound good. No, uh, no. I, I get uh, I get some pretty interesting feeds from um, from what's going on. I'm not told when, and I ple- I hope you guys. If anybody tells you when, they're lying. They don't know when. Okay. And I think you ruin your credibility when you put out a date. Why don't oh, you yeah. put out the facts and let people machinate, let people think about this stuff on their own and let them see what they come up with. But again, the more data you have, but the problem is, is all market right now are manipulated. So what market do you want to be into? The ones that are being manipulated up or the ones that are being manipulated down? Well, let's take a look at the ones being manipulated down. What is being manipulated down? Gold and silver. Have gold and silver been assets for thousands of years? Yes. So why is silver being more heavily manipulated than gold? I think that's the Achilles heel of the whole banking system. You might be right on that. And I think another reason, too, is you've got to push with the green stuff. And they're, you know, they're trying to keep prices down to push some of that stuff as well. But overall, it's probably because it's the most accessible as well. If it gets anywhere close to a one to one ratio, most people can afford at least one silver eagle. No, they will not be able to. Well, right now, I mean. Oh, right so, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now. Yeah. yeah. So you really get it now. Look. I'm um, trying to suppress it so people don't see the value in it, so people don't yeah. buy it. If you go back to the U.S. debt clock, you'll see that an ounce of silver, they're saying, should be over, uh, what, $1,500 an ounce right now. I say right now, mathematically, it should be about $700 an ounce. If you can get it for 31 and it's money for thousands of years, why wouldn't you trade certificates that you know daggone well are going to become worthless one day because I'm holding them now, right? You did yep. think of think of all this worth of uh, purchasing power this once held. It doesn't hold anything now. Okay, now, now it's a fan. You could kind of spread them out <laughs> and fan yourself when it's hot. Where the malodor is sent to it, yeah. <laughs> but There's a lot of I don't, DNA want to know, there. I don't want to know where all that stuff's been. But you know, either. an answer I would give to this too is you know my rule of thumb for holding cash is I don't want to be forced to sell my silver when we might have a you know up and downs of silver going around so i like to hold enough cash i can operate my business i can operate my family and what a period of time for what period of time i look at about three months worth of um expenses Perfect. not income yep uh folks i just met jared i uh he reached out to me and i did a little research on him He's had the right answers. I haven't, we haven't had a chat up front. I haven't told him what I'm I think this has been a two, this is probably a two hour interview of Jared, right? <laughs> has it been two hours? <laughs> We've been two hours. Yeah, we probably, <laughs> oh goodness. We're never going to get any, never going to be like on this, something I, this long. I'm going to need some tacos here pretty soon. I need like Amy <laughs> to bring me some tacos down from okay. the Bay Area is what I need. Right. But any other questions or anything? I'd, I'd like to leave on a high note. Okay. The I, future I is bright. This has been great. The future is bright. We're going to go back to prices of about 1955. Silver's going to go to the moon. It's been held up for so long, over 170 years of uh, price manipulation. Have you ever heard of this series of, called Pull Dark? Okay. Pull Dark is a, ser- is a series about this guy that inherits a mine in, uh, in old England and how the whole system was corrupted even back then. Pull Dark wanted to pay his miners a relatively nice, a nicer wage. But he couldn't get the money that he needed from the assayer because the assayers, the people that, that refine it and all, okay, and they send it off to the mint that actually makes the coins, okay, they were all in business together and Poldark was not in the club. So they refused to buy Poldark's silver and gold that came out of the mine. So Paul Dark then said, well, I got to go up the next level. I got to I got to become my own alloy guy and start making my own uh, mm-hmm. saying and making the actual metal, okay? 
So basically he got frozen out. This is a very deep conspiracy. Conspiracy simply means a bunch of people meeting to, uh, to discuss a plan that isn't good for everybody else. And a theory is what they're actually doing and how they're going to do it. So a conspiracy theorist, I don't think have been wrong yet. Do you? Only a couple of really extreme ones, but majority of what I've heard has been spot on. And I think a lot of people right now don't think that banks can collapse. Like, here, here's what I'll point to. Why every, industry, every industry has somewhere between five and nine companies that are left. And that's it. It's called oligarchies. It's what everything wants to go to. It's what these guys up above that are controlling everything want. They want a few companies so they can control it. How do you bring a CBDC out and have a digital currency for the country with 4,500 banks? There's not going to be a, a CBDC. Each country is going to have their own currency. There's 207 countries. The yes. gold and the silver has already been repatriated back to them. The U.S. But the plan, there's been a plan to do that, right? There's been a plan. There's been a lot of talk. Oh, Lord, yeah. I think it was JFK and his group put the plan together. Heck, he might have faked his own assassination. I don't know. Something's called a squib. I, I just learned about that. <laughs> I don't know anything squib. about it. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Better find out what a squib is. Uh, interesting. <laughs> Look, <laughs> um, there's a lot you're not being told, but what I'm telling you is the truth. I am telling you the truth. Do some research on me. Do some research on the Provenza Group. Find how many thousands of trusts we did just so you know who I am. Because you've yeah. been told lies and you need to know that what I'm telling you the truth and what Jared has gone out on a limb here and brought me on this show. Um, I guess you could have went over with a whole bunch of funds down, huh? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see. I, you we know, I think, look, I'm doing this to get the, the knowledge and information out there. I mean, guys, I'm, I'm giving you the information like Ted is, I can't say everything that I know that's out there. Um, but I can tell you guys that they're, you know, I'm trying to wake people up and get them to get more prepared. So we've got, we've got this person here. I don't know, come on sense, but you know, still on the fence with silver and, and precious metals. And what I can tell you is um, one of the things why, I've learned. I, in life, why, don't we, why don't we ask why he made a statement? Yeah. Why are you still on the fence? Why are you still on the fence? That's a good idea. If you can Why? answer, if you can answer that, that'd be great. Then we can. Where have I gone wrong? What What do you think you know that it would negate what the facts are that I presented, and uh, historical facts as well, and all types of math and everything else that goes into proving what I'm telling you is true? You're facing what's called normalcy bias. Normalcy yeah. bias is where you. <laughs> it's completely outside of what you. With think this stuff, guys. Exactly. With this stuff. <laughs> That's right. When I first started working, I got paid four dollars a week to deliver ninety-six newspapers six days a week for four dollars. What does four dollars buy now, folks? We it's a very stealth. It's a very stealth um, uh, uh, tax that's going on with regards to this inflation. Let me take a minute just to explain this. I know we're, we're going over, but this is, I, I don't know whether or not we're going to have another chance. I hope we do. Okay. But let's suppose Jared and I, we're going to start a restaurant. Have you ever had a bowl of crab bisque, one bowl of crab bisque and you're full and two crackers? You ever had something like that, Jared? I've, I've had clam chowder. I, okay. it may be, I, I don't know if I had, I've had the bisque. We, we tend to not well, get we're on the East Coast. We're going to talk about crabs over here. We'll talk about the oysters and clams over the clam chowder. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So the deal is this, we're making this clam chowder at 20 gallons in a pot. Okay. Huh? And is in depression. I mean, right now we're in a depression right now. Okay. And um, so we're selling this stuff and we actually want to do a nice thing for everybody. So we're selling it for a dollar. But what happens to us? The costs go up, right? So I go to Jared and I said, man, I said, we're not making it. We got to make more money. We got to bring more, more revenue in. And uh, Jared says, man, we can't do that. The crowd won't accept more than a dollar for a bowl of soup or a cloud or chowder or whatever. I said, well, why don't we put, say, half a gallon of water and see what happens? And guess what happens, Jared? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing happens because you don't taste it. No okay? one notices it. Yeah, yeah, I it's get it. It's very okay. slight, okay? But the calories aren't in this bowl of soup that you used to have, so you're not going to feel as full as you used to. So I said, a month later, I said, Jared, that worked out pretty well. You didn't get any complaints, did you? Jared says, no, but I don't really feel good about that. Well, neither do I, but I got to feed my family too. So next time we add three gallons of water in it. And it's it, it doesn't quite look the same, okay? But we're still charging a dollar for the bowl. But now guess what we get to sell in addition to the bowl of soup, a cup of soup, a half a sandwich. Have you been in a restaurant where they sell a cup of soup and a bowl and a half a sandwich? Yeah, Why for like 20, 20 bucks now. Why? 20 bucks now. For what? For, a, for you go to Panera, 
and you go get a cup and a uh, a cup of soup and a half sandwich in California, 20 bucks. You guys are crazy. <laughs> and it's about to go higher because next month we now go to a $20 an hour minimum wage for fast food. People will make more money selling fast food. So a high school small. dropout is going to make $40,000 a year? Yes. How messed up is that? Inflation. We're going to have hyperinflation in California starting next month. Yeah, right. Because the purchasing power just isn't there. It can't be there because the crazy. So my my kids are going to come to me and they're going to say, Dad, I want to go get you know a Panera sandwich and a half soup. And it's going to be like 20, 20 to 25 bucks, somewhere around there. And I'm going to say, go get a job at Panera and you can have as much soup and sandwiches as you want. We'll come to Ted's house and detail a couple of cars and I'll give you 20 bucks. <laughs> <There> you <go. laughs> All right. Well, Ted, this has, been, this has been awesome. Um, I'm going to give you the quick count here on your channel. I want to see where we got you up to because we've been we've been putting a lot of promotion in there. So we have gotten you up to uh, 633 subscribers. And oh, I think you started off at 5, uh, 588. So hopefully that's okay. a little parting gift for you. Um, How many it's comments been great. do you I have? It. How many comments? Many comments? Do you have? Uh, we've got 188 people in the chat right now. I uh, let me see. If oh, the comments. Coming. Okay, I forgot. The comments come after the show's over. I forgot about that. Yeah, I think the show's going to be over this, to uh, three or four times. Um, folks, what do you think? Am I doing a good job here? I mean, uh, am I too nasty? Too fast? Too quick? <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> You'd so be let's, surprised. Let's like a couple heard. quick questions. I am here. what so I am. If you want to hear it? It's here. So here's the first thing I'm going to throw out. Um, if you guys like my channel stickers, okay, the first 10 people to send me an email today. And in that email, I want them to put Ted Speaks on that email. I will send the first 10 people that email me, stackingsurfer at gmail.com. I will send you guys a channel sticker. Um, and we'll get that out to you guys, uh, well, nice, tomorrow man. probably. So we'll do that. Um, what do they look like? Do you have one I can see? I, I I will. I'll be right back. Let me. Okay. I'm going to pull it up. It's really cool. So I'm I'm going to let you talk for one more second here. Um, they're saying great job and everything else, but you have exactly one minute to distill a little bit more truth. Okay. All right, folks. Here are some of the comments here. Um, let's read this one. Hi Ted. My wife and I rolled our 401k over into a precious metals IRA, and a year and a half ago, we went through American Hartford Gold to set it up via equity institutional through Equity Trust Company as our self-directed account custodian. We chose International Depository Services Group who have vault locations in Texas, Delaware, and Canada as our previous metals depository. Why don't you hold them yourself? After hearing you speak on Ron's channel, I told my wife about what you said concerning if you don't hold it, you don't own it. We do. She called IDSG, the vault company, and asked them if the government could seize our precious metals from their depository, and they said, yes, the government can seize deposits from any precious metals depository. We were shocked. Oh, my. Uh, we had just paid them $550 to hold on to our metal for another year. They also want to charge $250 for each account to withdraw our metals. Ted, do you know if we can take possession of our metals could we, we would owe any taxes on the withdrawal of our two accounts. P.S. Thank you for not, uh, for your honesty and transparency to speak truth. May God richly bless you and your family and your work back at you. God bless you too. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for wanting to learn because, you know, knowledge is what you got to have. I went oh, to yeah. James Madison and said, knowledge is liberty. Absolutely right. The more you know, the more you can do. Okay. Not so these are the time. types of messages that we're getting here. And I've received others that they've been wiped out completely and their funds moved into a depository that they you didn't know anything that. about. So that. that, that's not the way you do financial planning, folks. I know it. No, and you, you've got me thinking about a few things after our conversation and all, you know, the other thing I'm going to put out there, guys, is um, if you haven't read the Constitution, go read the Constitution. You need to understand what the founding fathers did here. And I believe they were all inspired by God. I can we can we stop that. on that just a second, please? Sure. Because yep. it says in there that we're supposed to have a well-regulated militia, right? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Do you think the precious metals market should be regulated as well? It's not. No, it, See, no, folks, it's not what I want you to do is I would like you to understand that there aren't any rules out there. I was talking with Jeff from, uh, from Niles Barton and Wilmer, and I said, Jeff, it's crazy. He said, what's like the wild, wild west out there? I said, that's funny. So, that's, exact, that, that's exactly what I was thinking. 
We have to have rules. If you don't have rules, you don't have a society. And the people that are telling you what to do with your money, they don't have any money themselves. They're not trained. And you really ought to see what they look like. They're not professional people, and you're trusting all your hard-earned labor to them. And some of you might be trusting inheritances you've received as well. You're certainly trusting the, yeah. the disposition of the inheritances to the children and grandchildren you might want to help. But there's so much more we need to talk about in terms of pertinent per sterpes, per capita, um, uh, the interrogum clause, um, hypothecation, rehypothecation, what a spend, what a spendthrift trust does, who can challenge a trust. What the purpose of a uh, of a um, advanced healthcare directive is? When does it spring? Uh, do you want to be kept in a persistent vegetative state or be kept in an end stage condition that uh, you want to be receiving food and water? This is the kind of stuff did for twenty seven years, but I didn't come on the radio or television. Didn't tell live stream. Dag on it. Live stream. Live stream. There you go. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it. But anyway, the bottom line is, folks, is I've, I've had a lot of experience in doing this. I'm not making any money off of you. Any money that do make off of this, I'm putting it back in to put better content because you guys got to know the facts. Now, when this is all over and the reset happens, then we'll start talking to you about estate planning, what you need to do in order to protect what it is that you have. Because most people want to have 100% of their assets go to their intended beneficiaries. But if you don't use a trust-based estate plan and you use a will-based estate plan in, instead, yeah. less than 100% is going to go where you want it to go. Besides, anybody can challenge it as well. Additionally, wills uh, a revocable living trust negates the need to actually have a power of attorney. Powers of attorney are not legally binding. So let's suppose that Jared and I are great friends and um, and I decide to make him my power of attorney. Well, something happens between Jared and I, although the power of attorney has already been drafted, and I want Margaret Ann to be my new power of attorney. How does the bank know that the power of attorney that Jared is holding is the latest issue? They don't know about the one that Margaret Ann's holding, right? Yep. So if the bank goes ahead and gives Jared your money, and turns out that Margaret Ann shows up and says, "What happened to the account balance?" And oh, we gave it to Jared. Well, I got the latest. Uh, I got the latest uh, power of attorney. Look at the date. They didn't know that. So you got to hold what it is at your own. Okay. These are troubling times. This, this is not. This is not the time to be trusting anything or anyone other than God and the periodic table. Get away from the script. Get away from the paper. When you're holding the money. You're holding what the currency is going to be issued against anyway. But besides, let's suppose you want to go someplace else. If you're holding money, they'll issue the currency in any in any uh, country around the world. All yeah. the gold and all the silver, once the playing field is level, okay, is going to be one to one. There won't be any arbitrage between being able to send raw materials over to China and get it sent back here at a lower price and we can make it here. All that stuff, that was all fake. OK, how can you ship this stuff halfway around the country, around the world, have people assemble it around? That whole, that whole thing's a mess that we we even allowed it to happen in the first place. It's all because of Keynesian uh, economics. It is. They're, they're creating distortions. And that's what I was talking about as far as the upstream yeah. battle that's going on, causing all the rapids and the turmoil downstream. I'd like to find that cartoonist guy. He does a really good job on this type of stuff with the swirling little things. Oh, the bank's going nuts. Oh, the lending is going crazy. Oh, the bonds are crazy. Oh, look yeah. at the used car market. The new car market. <laughs> I mean, it's all downstream from these two Goliaths, Austrian monetary economics and Keynesian economics, having a big battle. And yep. one of them's going to win. Who do you think is going to win? Kenzie, Austrian monetary. Austrian going to win. Keynesian, Keynesian basically goes broke and doesn't work. So here, here's my currency. My first one is this sticker that's kind of fun. Ooh, I'd like one of those. Stacking surfer. We'll yeah. definitely send you out. And then I, I like have silver. As if these are the fun ones. Oh, that's really neat. A little surfboard, and then, um, and then this is the original one. Oh, that's cool. That's so really that one's cool. kind of I fun. Like so, yeah. you know, my whole the whole reason I went with surfing is I, I like to surf. I'm not like a pro surfer. I don't go surf these monster waves or anything, but I love going out and surfing when I can. It's a great physical exercise. It's a great mental exercise because you're sitting there waiting for waves to come in. Most people think you're just catching them all the time. No, you might be sitting there for 30 minutes to, to find the right wave. But um, it's life. also we have a massive wave of gold and silver right. coming you guys to get ready for. So that that's really why I ended up picking it is it has more to do with what's happening. We're, we're like on the edge of this massive wave that's starting to set up. You think your crowd would be very upset with me if I, I, told, I said, I told you so when this happens. 
Okay. Will you have me back on after this happens and silver goes to 2,000, 5,000 an ounce, which is where it should go right now, much higher than that. I've actually done the math. It's going to go much higher, higher than that. Can I come back on and say I told you so? Yes, you can totally do that. All right, good. I'll feel good then. All right. So for any of you guys on the fence right now that don't own any silver or gold, I think you need to take a strong look at this. I think you need to look at prices. Go to kitco.com. Um, you can see the prices historically of what it's done. Mm -hmm. um, it is heavily suppressed. For any of you that are really into crypto and you think that Bitcoin has a finite number of Bitcoin, you don't understand derivatives. Um, they can easily put derivatives on top of that and start selling paper Bitcoin. Why not? You'll blow it's it up. Wild, wild West out there, right? You'll blow it up. So don't think that just because you have Bitcoin, it's safer and everything else. People don't talk about it, but it can go into a derivatives market. They just did the ETF. How do you get BlackRock to go from hating it to loving it in five years? You, they figure out how to win with it and they figure out how to manipulate it. So I'll leave it on kind of that note. But Ted, thank you very much. Stick around for just a second. I just wanted to um, to say thank you I'm after the stream ends. So my pleasure. Great yet. meeting you guys. Love you, everybody. Hopefully thank we'll hear you. From you. If you want to be included in the class action suit, let me know. Definitely. And then hit the subscribe and the bell icon, guys. And we'll see you soon on the next live stream, the next video. Oh, I'm going to have a really cool pirate uh, pirate treasure silver video coming out tomorrow that you guys are going to love. It's, it's going to be like Pirates of the Caribbean. So check it out. Till next time.